season. <laughs> Our us hardcore Mountain Dew drinking gamers are playing Animal Crossing New Horizons. Here's the thing I'll say about Doom is that on the surface it seems like, you know, this this fantasy, this violence fantasy about slaying demons. But really what it is, Max, it's about slaying society's notion of taboo and what is prohibited and learning new forms of pleasure, really, and opening yourself up to experiencing new different ways of being. It's about opening up and letting yourself enjoy killing demons. <laughs> it's about opening up. And not up. just the killing of demons. It's about opening up the demons with your hands, <laughs> specifically. It's... It's it's not it's not this violent thing, Max. It's beautiful. It's I an mean, emotional transformation. It is beautiful, um, and that. Speaking of violence and beautiful, yeah, that's a lot like the movie that we're doing today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max, and I'm Austin. And you're right. That's true. <laughs> that's a good transition. Why, thank you, kind sir. Yes, today we're doing the wonderful 1974 film. 71. 71 film, A Clockwork Orange by Stanley Kubrick, which was Austin's pick. It was. So, Austin, why did you pick this film? Uh, That's a good question. Let me think. Okay, so... <laughs> The reason I picked this film uh, is because we've been we've been sort of in the midst of uh, managing and restarting the show and everything during this coronavirus crisis. And you know what? I just felt like it was a good time to do like one of those monolithic milestone type movies. We've done a few of these. We've done movies like Un Chien Andalou or um, what's another one we've done? I mentioned one and now I can't think of another one. Well, uh, Sherlock Jr. was big. Wizard of Gore. Wizard. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I love how you agreed with me for half a second. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's not talk about Wizard of um, I mean, Repo the Genetic Opera was a big monolith movie yeah. for me. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, to Be or Not to Be was a big deal. Uh, we also did Detour was a really big deal. Strangers on a Train. Um, yeah, not like super big. But the point is, it's like, it's a monolithic, like important milestone movie. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I still think this is not the biggest movie we've done on the show, but this is one of the most important ones. And uh, even though I wouldn't say that I'm like as reverent towards this movie as a lot of people are. In fact, one of the things we'll talk about over the commentary track is uh, maybe you and I aren't as hot on this movie as everyone else. Um, even though we appreciate many things about it, I think I'm still very glad that we have this opportunity to discuss it. And I really don't think this movie is one of my favorites now in like Kubrick's oeuvre at this point. Um, I used to really enjoy it as a teenager, but honestly, I think my swing on this movie um, and sort of the way my taste in film changed, I really started to move past my interest in this one. Uh, pretty quickly, I think. So I've really not watched this movie too much in the last, like, I want to say like five years. <laughs> Maybe I've watched it several times, um, but I still find a lot of value in it. I just don't think it's really that tremendous or really nearly as intelligent as many people would um, treat it. Uh, I know Stanley Kubrick is one of those directors where he has like the cult of the auteur thing going on. He's a, one of the big film bro directors, as I know we will both discuss during this commentary. Oh, and... God, yes. uh, I think he's one of the best filmmakers and some of his movies I think are truly fantastic, but I think this is actually kind of a bit of a misfire from him. And I understand that we're not going to be able to discuss everything about this movie over the commentary track because he's a director who makes movies that are that whether you like them or not, they are sophisticated. So my opinion on this could change at some point. It's just that I think it's not quite as successful as uh, the other movies in his uh, catalog, especially the two that it's bracketed by. I mean, Barry Lyndon is a better movie than this. 2001 is definitely a better movie than this. And um, I think I think it's one of those movies for me that is not, it doesn't surpass the sum of its parts. Huh. Um, but obviously very culturally important. It is. And I'm going to go into my backstory with this movie because okay i think i i this movie like this movie and the book it was based on were very important to me <laughs> when i was a high schooler i read the book in high school and i saw the movie shortly afterwards mm -hmm. um it always kind of baffled me that they left the last chapter out in the movie but that's a point we'll get to later mm -hmm. and 
for me, the book was just this sort of like profane exercise in creativity with this interesting message that I had never seen before written entirely in a makeshift slang that you had to like fully and like engulf yourself in. It's a real experience to engage with. Um, which as a teenager, like you'd never, I had never seen anything like that before and few authors are willing to go that far. Um, and then the movie, the movie for me as a young goth, um, was, I don't want to say life changing, but it's pretty close. (laughs) Like, at the time, holy shit, look at all this radical aesthetic. Look at this, like, what if the 70s but more and punk and just retro futurist type thing? What, yeah, what if dystopia but, like, not in the 1984, like, monolithic buildings and stuffy gray suits type way, but, like, people dressing up in these flagrant gang outfits yep. and just taking the streets by themselves a very singular vision yes um it affected me (laughs) so much um my first steam name was your humble narrator thank you for uh confessing to your cringeworthy past i admire it if you want to say that's cringeworthy go for it but um (laughs) that's actually the decemberists in uh, my favorite album by theirs um the hazards of love they uh have a character called the rake because the entire album is this long play basically Okay. And he only refers to himself as your humble narrator the entire time. Um, but it sort of stopped there. Like I really loved it in high school. It sort of shaped my view of just like, wow, this movie is incredible. It's based off a book that I thought was incredible. And the movie I loved, not just for the costume design and the world building, but also great use of colors, great use of great acting on Malcolm McDowell's part. Yeah. But then after like that, I sort of just, that was my opinion on the movie. Okay, cool. We've watched it. It's Kubrick. It's good. I started watching other Kubrick movies and the fact that they were also amazing only some further cemented my opinion that Glocker Orange was also one of my favorite movies of all time, but it's also over two hours long and I had watched it so many times in high school that like I could basically like reenact any scene <laughs> So I stopped watching it for a while and time sort of passed around me. And upon revisiting it this week, I do want to say like, I don't think I'm going to be as harsh on it as Austin, but a lot of this movie has not aged well for me. And I think it sort of has this overall message of not both the book and the movie of nihilistic hopefulness and an idea of choice, which is key to just the central tenant of the movie, which I think is good, but I think the movie is less committed to nailing than the book is. And the movie relies heavily on aesthetics to make you sort of as sort of a distraction for the fact that it doesn't really land on its moral message or any sort of, complete character arc for Alex. Yeah. I I mean, we'll dive into the complexities of like what you mean by nihilistic hopefulness. I'm not quite sure. I agree with that. I agree with the (laughs) nihilism of, of the movie, but I feel like I definitely, for me, the idea is like this movie is a, it is most, mostly an accomplishment of like design. Yes. And like bringing these technicians together to work together on a film and you know, terrific casting in a movie that is like, like a clock very well designed, but also there's the subtext is not thoroughly explored in the way that it could be. It's not that it doesn't have subtext. It's that it kind of in a way that I might sort of connect to the idea of it being nihilistic seems to think it's saying something when really it seems like it's just throwing its hands up in the air a little bit. And uh, it's a little bit messy because of that. It's not that there aren't sophisticated things going on subtextually. It's that they don't amount to as much as I think the movie thinks it amounts to. Um, And all the stuff along the way is really impressive visually and awesome on its own. And uh, obviously, like you said, it's one of those movies that sort of invented uh, or at least innovated in a direction of like sci-fi futurist aesthetic 
um, and influenced a lot of other artists and movies, but I don't think on its own that it, it sort of stands up to what its impact has been on culture. I don't, I don't think I come down as hard on it as you do. It's just like with my modern, with a more adult brain and like a different time I'm living in. It's, there's also the fact of like, do I want to watch a movie that is just like, Oh, the main character is a constant rapist and like constant. (laughs) Yeah. Only has fun when he's raping and or killing. And it's just like, maybe someday, but like 99% of the time, I'm just going to be like, uh, ooh, especially yeah. when it feels like it's not making a strong enough point yeah. about everything that's going on. And we're going to talk a lot about like, you and know, the movie does like the first couple of times, like try to like, isn't it like we're like, Oh, the juxtaposition of like the happiness, the happy so- yeah, song and dance versus the atrocities. But like once you know, those are coming and once, you've seen them before and the sort of like novelty and shock has worn off. It's just like, okay though, do I really need to keep revisiting this? Yeah. Cause I think I don't, I don't, I wouldn't place this as far down probably on Kubrick's oeuvre as you would, I would assume, but it's, it's slightly just disheartening for me to come back to a movie that, did shape me for better or for worse for all of my teenage years and just sort of be like, Oh, Hmm. But I feel like that's okay too. No, it's okay. Novelty and shock is a big part of what this movie's vision and power is, I think. And, um, and yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about how it mixes like the good and the bad and moral depravity with, you know, uh, a sense of virtue, but like, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a movie that is the type of movie that is designed in such a way to, have an impact because there's lots of impressive things about it. And yet also because of the way in which it is structured and it's subtext, it seems also like a movie that hopefully you grow out of in certain ways, not saying that you can't return to it and find new interesting things about it, but it's not really a super intelligent movie in the way that I feel like some of Stanley Kubrick's other films actually are much more intelligent. Yeah. Uh, I know as a director, he's one of those film bro directors And I feel like a lot of the way that people have like this reverence for him is like laughable and stupid, but also like a lot of his movies really, really are smart. No, it's not like him in the shining confessing that he like filmed the moon landing. What the fuck is wrong with you? Um, But he does have a lot of interesting things about America in that movie. It's a very intelligent movie. uh, And a lot of his other films aside from the shining uh, stuff like 2001, stuff like Dr. Strangelove, stuff like The Killing, which we've done on the show. Yeah. Uh, stuff like Barry, Barry Lyndon, too. All of it is very smart. Eyes Wide Shut, another great movie. Uh, it's just that this one, I think, is maybe more so than the other ones, too, responsible for initiate, inaugurating him into that film bro uh, sort of canon, I guess, and also like introducing this weird type of reverence for him as well. I think also, well, I think we should probably get to the movie. Yeah. But I think it's also because 2001 is basically shown in every film class of just like, this is the movie. <laughs> yeah. After I'm, citizen Kane, you watched <laughs> this movie. Yeah. But I just, I do think it's important to touch on in the introduction, how interesting it is in, in the history of like a clockwork orange in its reception compared to other movies, how it is this movie that, that plays with people in a certain way. Like a lot of people watch this movie and they're sort of blown away, but then there's a good number of people who do wind up revisiting it and finding it not necessarily quite as intelligent. And then there's an equal number of people who are just like totally uh, interested in it forever. And there's so many great things that I'll always return to this movie for, but it's not like this really profound statement for me. Understandable. Yeah. You ready to get going? Yeah, I am. So, okay. uh, yeah, let's start. Video well, my friends. Video well. Red. It's red, Max. 
thank you, Austin. As as our listeners may not know, I recently went colorblind, so <laughs> I enjoy this movie significantly less because of it. Yeah, you would be missing a lot. This is a very wonderful, colorful movie. However, Max, I gotta say, it's a little bit bizarre that this is a clockwork orange and begins with red. Um, yeah. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, I wasn't trying to bring up cinema sins and annoy our, all our listeners. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just making a bad joke. I do want to talk about, though, the fact that I think everybody like at this point knows why it's called a clockwork. Ah, oh, what an iconic shot of Malcolm McDowell, though. This this is the movie. That shot of Malcolm McDowell is the movie. Though. It is the movie. This is definitely a movie that it's like you can show the opening shot and it lays out a lot of subtext for, for what's going on in the rest of it. It's a very intelligent opening shot. And we'll be talking about that quite a bit, but yeah, continue what you were saying. Um, we, I was just saying that like, cause in, it never explicitly states it in the book, but like the title of this movie, a clockwork orange yeah, is I think central to the whole thesis of this movie that, if you take the ability of choice of good and evil away from people, Mm -hmm. then their heart, which is what we associate with morality, literally just becomes a clockwork orange. It's like a mechanical thing that beats back and forth to keep you alive. But like to introduce my (laughs) problems with this movie, the movie, I don't think focuses enough on that upon reviewing it. And we've seen that imagery used in other films we've done on the show too. Uh, I think the one I remember most is from Hellboy. And that one also that one also relates it more to the political end of the idea of clockwork. The imagery in that movie of the clockwork soldier being the ultimate Nazi weapon because yeah. it's they describe it as being animated by this evil, intangible will, but it's ultimately just clockwork and sand and there's nothing inside of it because it's this entirely regulated machine being. And it's kind of horrifying for that. Can I say a weird thing that may not be like entirely <laughs> uh, weird, but like looking back on it because uh, to our listeners who don't know at home, I identify as non-binary, mm-hmm. but um, I think this movie might've been like the first like tinges of that. Cause like there are a lot of times where I would just like get fake eyelashes and wear those around. And when like people ask them like, Oh, it's like, you know, a clockwork orange thing and people would normally brush it off. But the ability to like, profess whatever you want without it being gendered sort of was. Yeah. Gender is a very interesting thing in this. And also what you're talking about, the manner in which our drugs here choose to express it is very interesting and also contradictory. There's going to be ways in which I was actually thinking about this. There's ways in which they sort of um, can be seen as like, I don't know. I don't want to go so far as like queering, like a heterosexual masculine identity, but they are applying an aesthetic to it that is more playful in many ways than you might expect from other characters, their own age in, in like the UK or U S at the time. Um, and at the same time though, Max, they also contradictory, contradictorily express that type of masculine energy in very, you know, uh, stereotypically like violent and like, sadistic ways Does, you know, but that leads us into the fact that when we were watching for the pre-screening <laughs> yesterday i said that this homeless man is like a boomer and i think like the droogs are how all boomers view uh zoomers <laughs> nowadays as just like yeah. these weirdos in strange outfits who want to destroy the world around them that's one of the weird questions about the subtext of this movie because it is slightly you know unclear to us we were sort of throwing around the idea maybe is whether or not certain scenes in this movie seem to support the notion that this movie is made almost as a satire of like an idea of generation gap there are this is a very comedic movie and there's many different elements that are clearly clearly satirized but we weren't entirely sure whether that was like the case because I feel like the movie doesn't subtextually become a cohesive thing in the points it's making. You can tell it's making points in different scenes, but not, and not, not every scene. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't all seem to support the same thesis maybe, but that's such as this scene. Um, yeah, this is highly disturbing. I've seen people talk about how this is like supposedly more comedic because of the way this is shot. But I actually think the more no. straight on angle and the, the lighting 
and also the way in which they are performing this rape scene makes it highly, highly disturbing. This no, this is, I was talking with Austin about this the other day where like, this is more shocking than yeah. if you tried to do violent, like sharp edits and yeah. shoot from different angles and show her face in agony. The fact that everything is just there. Yeah. I am. This is very uncomfortable. It's not aestheticized. No. And that's why people seem to think of it associating it, not everyone, but just some critics I've been reading for this movie. And they talk about it as like com deadpan comedy shots. And aesthetically, it is a straightforward deadpan approach, but it's not actually, there's no comedic effect. It's like, that just makes it more horrifying because you're just watching this woman in, in a very disturbing image on its own, by the way, the fact that they just ha played that like method, I'm sure. And basically Kubrick, I'm sure just said to these people, listen, just struggle until you get so fucking tired that you can't move. Yeah. And that's what we're watching. And that's why it's so fucking disturbing, but also a very interesting moment that I know I've brought up uh, before to you during the pre-screening uh, in this scene is when the camera tracks with her as she runs out of the theater, because this is one of the few moments where it seems like the camera actually pays attention to a woman as a real person instead of just like a decoration <laughs> or, you know, something that exists in relationship to the men. Like the, this movie is very much focused on Alex's perspective. <laughs> Great choreography here. I was saying this scene would be greatly because I like, this is fucking, this is funny. I yeah. think of just like shit constantly breaking and dim, like pinwheeling his arms around the ease with which everything breaks is great. But I was saying this scene would be great if it just went on for like another 20 minutes of like stuff getting progressively bigger and they just keep breaking it <laughs> like over. That's, like that bit with like how they cut out the like Ed 209 thing in like Robocop or shooting that guy for like 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. That'd be really funny. And then they just, they go from this wide shot and then they cut back to them fighting more. That'd be really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be funny. But no, I just to finish up that point, I we probably are going to refer back to that moment where the camera tracks with the girl as she's running out of the uh, auditorium more because that scene, that camera move alone shows that we we as an audience and the movie itself in its regard for the action is not entirely only within Alex's subjectivity because he is not paying attention to that girl, he's paying attention to the other gang. Well, he notices that she runs away, but like in any other movie that might be just like, oh, the hero made sure the girl got saved. But like, I don't think he notices she runs away. Yeah. I think the camera does. I think he is focused on. I know. Them. I'm saying if it was her, yeah, him. But oh, like, yeah. From what we know about Alex, like <laughs> that also has to do yeah. with some of these sort of um, latent homosocial elements and alternates between homosocial and homoerotic, which I guess I could just define here partially as homoerotic is kind of self-explanatory and we can debate about whether or not this movie is at different points, potentially homoerotic. But I think this movie is inarguably definitely homosocial, which is adjacent to homoeroticism. Just boys being boys. It is. It's like homosocial seems to me more specifically sexist against women because it's like, homosocial identification doesn't have to be erotic in any way. It can be eroticized, but it's not necessarily like erotic as an end of itself. It's yes. like you're just taking pleasure in like masculine superiority over everything. We talked a lot about this during our Sherlock Jr. episode where it's almost like gender in that one is like girls aren't allowed in the clubhouse because they're icky. <laughs> but I aspire to be Sherlock Holmes because I'm a man and I can figure out anything with my other men, right? Men, <laughs> you know, and they're all hilariously incompetent. <laughs> um, unfortunately in this movie, the, the drugs are very competent at what they do. Yeah. But, and it's amazing how we're, we're zooming along here, much like the, the drugs in their amazing car. In these great scenes. <laughs> their Jetsons car. Apparently. <laughs> this is kind of like a slightly Jetsons esque aesthetic. Well, yeah, it's like, it's the seventies It was the lead up. It was from the sixties, the Jetsons, yeah. but, but this is just, it's a great retro futurist sort of vision of the future. And I do think like really these parts of the movies really emphasize how skilled truly the people working on this movie are. I'm, I don't want to just reduce it to Kubrick because that just seems like the easiest move that everyone makes, but he clearly is proving that he's a fantastic director, if not, you know, writer maybe in this movie. Um, where, why would you ever close that? Close Sorry, what? The, the egg 
thing she's sitting in looks like it can be closed. Just, I know. But that's one of the weird things <laughs> about the furniture and decor and everything. Oh, this is the first time we see this shot. This is a shot we see replicated so many times in this movie where there's like somebody talking through a door and there's someone on the other side, but it's a very flat sort of um, linear perspective on this image. Do you see what I'm talking about in that shot where it's like clearly the scene is right in front of us? But also another thing that's interesting is that the camera is just far enough away that the walls of the of the hallway stretching towards the subject in the frame they're just enough of a distance as to make it like a frame within a frame. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And we uh, see that a bunch in this movie. I mean, Cooper, yeah, Kubrick is always astonishingly great with that, but it's part of his like aesthetic of cold detachment, which again, in this, in this rape scene, the famous one compared to the first one, we abandon that aesthetic of detachment for these wild, like extremely wide angle lens close-ups. Yes. And that's why, even though this is also an incredibly disturbing scene, it does not really disturb me the same way. It doesn't the disturb first me. One. It, yeah. And it's also like, I do want to say just for any people who love film trivia, the fact that he's singing, singing in the rain, it was just cause he asked Malcolm McDowell to start singing around. And this is the only song he could, yeah. Think of off the top of his head. That yeah. He it, everything too. Some people say that it was like improvised in the take, which is not quite true, but no. he was like, what are some things? He's like, well, I could say sing, singing in the room. How, what do you think about that? Stanley? <laughs> and, uh, he, he liked it. And, um, no, because this is too well shot through multiple cameras to, yeah. Be completely improvised. But and yeah. I, I know we all love to say, you know, that was done in one take, but like, no, no, not yeah. always, but, and obviously with Kubrick, no, nothing is ever done just once. No. You're going to keep doing even it. If you, even if you end up using the first take, we're going to do it 800 more times. We do have some funny trivia about that later where it's some of the stupid, like Stanley Kubrick, we're going to do it a thousand times, a thousand mm -hmm. takes of this meaningless like shot. Um, and it's going to be funny later. Uh, but it is interesting that this moment seems to have been improvised because it seems like such a vital subtextual echoing moment. Um, this is not just a famous scene because of just the straightforward brutality of what's going on. Uh, it's also that the song becomes recontextualized much in the same way that as many critics enjoy pointing out many of Alex's own images and songs and culture that he enjoys will become recontextualized for him through treatment of the Ludovico technique. In some ways you could argue that they are performing their own version of the Ludovico technique for this uh for uh patrick mcgee here true yeah right they're for they're holding him down they have a thing in his mouth and uh they're forcing him to watch this image and the fact that they're performing it so much almost makes it look like they're putting on a show much in the same way that alex has to watch a film reel yeah and also you actually see some of the like conditioning that alex undergoes i think you can argue that patrick mcgee when Alex actually sings Singing in the Rain later and it gives away his identity, Patrick McGee also seems to demonstrate some evidence of like a, like a physical response, like a conditioned response. I think it, that, yeah, that comes across more as a panic attack than anything. Of just right. Sort of but it is like an echoing thing in a way that I feel like is maybe similar to the to conditioning. It's not quite the same. But. So what drugs do you think they put in the milk? Ooh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if people... Um, they never specify in the books. They, okay. They just... It's Malaco Plus. They they talk about how it's milk with some drugs added into it. The thing is... So the, the really neat thing about this, too, is that Stanley Kubrick in his career is just really great at adapting rich, like, books as, like, source yes. texts. And Anthony Burgess is an incredibly, like, erudite person... Like he, the fact of being able to actually create a language, there's a reason why not many authors seem to attempt that, or if they do, it doesn't quite stick as well as this one. He was emanating uh, James Joyce specifically, who is maybe the most erudite writer, famously so, um, to the point where many people just dismiss him out of hand. But like the fact that he was able to combine so much Russian slang with like the Cockney slang and then pull it off in this very like interesting way. And then also there's so many interesting things in the book with music and like the book has become a, re a like a real, like sort of treasure trove of like scholarship and interesting things sort of digging into it. 
Um, and I feel like you could do a lot of work just figuring out exactly what specific objects are in the book compared to the movie and then seeing if there's some way in which it makes some sort of difference in the subtext. I would say so. I, I only reread, uh, the first chapter and the last chapter in preparation for this yeah. screening. And I haven't read it in since high school. So that I was actually to give you an idea of how much I loved this book mm-hmm. in high school. Um, the one legacy I left on my high school is a clockwork orange is now on the summer reading list because I pestered every English teacher I ever had. So they all eventually <laughs> recommended it. Wow. So you're welcome <laughs> teens. That's an interesting conversation. A lot of people have too, is about the sort of, uh, I don't know the fact of language being so important in the book and the invented language. And also like you were saying in the introduction, the very important experience of reading it and learning as you're reading to engage with Alex on his own terms, because you have to learn his language in order to actually like visualize the scene he's discussing. Right. Exactly. So you only, you only see the scene that's happening when you accept his language. Whereas with film, it's a very different thing. And uh, there's a lot of criticism about how in the book that that language is used to distance people from the violence in, uh, in an intelligent and sophisticated way, whereas you don't get that with the film. And they do make concessions for that in the film version. Yeah. Um, for example, the girl earlier on was supposed to be a lot younger. Um, in the first scene that getting attacked by the Nazi gang, I believe 12, I think in the book. Yeah. If I remember correctly. And the two girls from the record shop later on in the next scene that we're going to see later, um, they're supposed to be like 14 at the oldest. And Alex like remarks to himself like, Oh, they think they're so cool skipping school for the first time. And when he takes them back to his place, like he just like sort of haphazardly remarks that like, by the end of it, they're all like crying and screaming at him because he was too rough with them. And I'm just like, so they do make concessions for the book, like being rougher and eviler in places. Yeah. But the movie still comes across as more like, or less hopeful and more just sort of like visceral in what yeah. it's showing you, which is yeah, strange when you look at the actual text of both. Yeah. But the other weird thing too, like, I guess it's it's just a scaling up of ages, but I I remember in the book Malcolm McDowell, his character Alex is more of a teenager, and then in this it's like Malcolm McDowell doesn't quite look to me like a teenager per se. He looks like he's in his early twenties. Yeah. Um, and also that's also just a Hollywood thing. Of, yeah. Like we don't cast <laughs> certain. Actually, how old was Malcolm McDowell? <laughs> I don't know. He was he was very young. He was cast in this movie off of another terrific performance where he's, he played a school kid in a, a wonderful Hello, movie Snake. called If from 1969, which is also very much about like generation gap and, and everything. And that one's even more specific to the UK. That's a Lindsay Anderson movie. It's really great. Uh, but no, I don't know quite how old he was. So one point we didn't make about the introduction, the sort of prologue with him and that amazing opening shot of him sort of looking out much like uh, this Ludwig van Beethoven poster, Max. Yes. Same face. Uh, And the zoom out, the slow zoom out, and then it pulls back and reveals the entire milk bar is how effectively that opening shot seems to uh, not only like really, really, really like cement the power of Alex's narration as like the driving force of what we're seeing. But it's also like, it's almost like visually mesmerizing with the narration. It's like, okay. Oh, and yeah, he wasn't a teenager at all, by the way. He was my age. He was 27. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, definitely older. Um, But yeah, so in that opening shot, it's, it's almost like much in the same way in the book, you have to learn to engage with the language before you really can follow what's happening in the movie, in the opening shot, it seems to be like we're slowly revealed the setting as he's talking, and it makes us understand that his language is describing the setting as we're revealing it, right? Um, and the most important thing, though, is that it really does cement that he is the one guiding like the mizzen scene of what's going on in this movie. That's why this movie feels so close to his own mind. I love that uh, 
Malcolm McDowell doing his best Christopher Lee Dracula impression <laughs> there He's in just that like montage. Smiling. I wonder how many takes they had to do for that. Well, like I think they had to do a lot. It's literally like dead on. It's literally just like yeah, that's just like they, they just got that like in their free time or whatever. They're like here, Malcolm McDowell, have some Dracula things and just look exactly like Christopher Lee. Yeah. You're 27. <laughs> Go to school, Malcolm McDowell. Yeah. Maybe the fact that he is slightly older is also like a slightly comical element to this. Well, his mom is very, his mom looks like a grandma almost. It is. It, people's ages are interesting too in the, in the manner in like how that compares to their behavior. I've seen some writing, but not a ton about how the mom is like, like why is the mom dressed the way she is compared to her husband who is dressed normally? Yeah, I don't like, know. It's I love like, it though. Yeah, I mean, the, just the design is amazing. There's so many like just disgustingly garish '70s things, but also they're garish in a way that seems somehow futuristic too. <laughs> it's just really amazing. Also, one of the like craziest things about this movie to me is how much like just blown out lighting. Oh my god, that sunflower has a smiley face on it. What do you make of that, Max? What do we make of the smiley face sunflower? <laughs> I don't know. Changed my opinions on this movie entirely. Actually, this movie's very hopeful. It's stupid. It's so dumb. This dumb sunflower movie. But yeah, no, this movie for me is mostly a triumph of design at this point. Everything is so incredibly well designed in it. <laughs> Such a great shot. It is a comedy shot. You laugh, yeah. but it like it is it is like goofy, right? And now we're coming back as like, oh, I thought I saw the truancy officer or whatever. And uh, this is definitely a great example of one of those cartoon Stanley Kubrick performances. Mm -hmm. Where obviously the the earliest type of performances like that are going to be from Doctor Strange Love, right? But I feel like that almost doesn't count because it's so dedicated to being cartoony that that it's like, that's just the genre of the movie he's working in. So he, ha he has to ha like have slightly cartoonish performances from that. Like it makes sense in Dr. Strangelove, the president's name is Muff Merkin. <laughs> right. But this, this movie isn't ostensibly a comedy. No, 100%. It's not, but, but like, then we still wind is... up with this. Yeah. It's a yeah. great time. Yes. <laughs> The time, yes, yes. See it here, Alex, yes. It is a cartoon. And uh, this is like the start of Stanley Kubrick seeming to like do that in his movies. Not that he would have a ton of movies after this, but it's like he, Stanley Kubrick does the thing where he like makes movies that their genre doesn't like scream, I'm a comedy. And yet somehow he works his way around to making them like amusing and like sardonic. And it's not... It doesn't like necessarily play as humor in the most explicit way as on the nose as this is. It's like it, <laughs> it's a very sardonic and cold humor. You were telling me the other day that like you can see Malcolm McDowell flinch constantly in so, this take. Because <laughs> so I have the Blu-ray and then it comes with a very fun commentary track of Malcolm McDowell spilling his guts about all the funny silly shit that went on and in this scene he was like very nervous about getting smacked in the balls multiple <laughs> times so if you pay attention you can see him like slightly eyeing the other actor's arm and he's like when is he gonna smack me in the balls and then right there see he moves his fist slightly in front of his dick to try to like <laughs> preemptively guard himself and he said it did not work <laughs> as you can kind of see yeah he said the other actor somehow like managed to bop his like hand like to punch his own dick even you can't gotta cup it you can't but then that would give away the scene it is so weird that just the angle of this is just like look at their taints isn't that fucking weird <laughs> <laughs> well you were talking about a homosocial or homoerotic thing right I think another to go off of the homoerotic versus homosocial thing, a, a very interesting moment in that regard is also the famous singing in the rain rape scene where they're performing for Patrick McGee 
so much at that point. It's like, it seems as if it's a very sadomastic or not sadomasochistic, but it's like, it's masochistic. It's sadistic because he's like, they're not, they're like raping this woman to do damage to Patrick McGee. Do you know what I mean? Kind of. Yeah. Like she only exists for Patrick McGee is to be a vehicle for him to get traumatized, (laughs) but they're, they're trying to hurt him by raping her, which is very bizarre and like disturbing, but also we can get into the fact that there are, I mean, there are no besides mom, there are like no, and even then, like, I guess mom's the core of the household, really, because dad's like distant and cold. Yeah, I don't way. know if you could argue there's any sympathetic women. These girls are sympathetic, I guess. Yeah. They just want like a fucking lollipop and to have sex. A dick lollipop and Alex is less judgmental of them in the movie than he is in the book. Um, in the book, he comes across as a hipster asshole. Cause they're all asking him about like the new releases and he, w- he is there to pick up his like special edition Beethoven fucking whatever. Oh God. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, look at him. He's dressed like Prince. So <laughs> except Prince, Prince would know better. Prince is not this stupid imbecile type of character. Really. Alex is like an imbecile. Really. You would hate Alex if you met him in real life because you'd just be like, you're just a shitty little kid. You're just like, a, like, I just want to punch you. <laughs> um, no, Alex is, is very much, and this is something I'm sure we'll talk about for the rest of the movie as well. He's very much. 2001. Uh, well, yeah. Right. Referencing front. himself. <laughs> Kubrick. Um, no, uh, Alex is very much something who, somebody who's like an alt-right asshole on the internet. I don't know. No. He's or how they vision themselves. I, I guess how they envision themselves, but like, I, I don't agree with the alt-right thing because j- mainly just because alt-right people don't even try for style. They just. Well, I imagine him as somebody who like thinks he knows how style, like I'm stylish. I have good taste in everything. And also like in that sort of vaguely Randian sad boy way, I, I would assume more than like full alt-right. <laughs> But also part of the political nature of this in some ways does make me feel like there's an undercurrent of, I don't know, right wing behavior to Alex. He, it's just the endless contradictions of everything that's going on in this. The, the government is shown as kind of fascistic and totalitarian in the way that it sort of tries to recuperate him and brainwash him. But also he also is uh, like a youth who is participating in like very fascistic type tendencies and music aside too. I mean, we're going to get into the whole Beethoven German Nazi music connection. Um, but also like the, uh, the idea that, uh, uh, he, he, he and his gang are sort of maybe comparable to like, I don't know, like, like a Brown shirts gang. I know it's not as like, political but they just go around beating the shit out of people and trying to ad- intimidate people and then they become cops you know i mean yeah the the other gang literally had nazi memorabilia on them yeah <laughs> and then they become did, did malcolm mcdowell have anything fun to say about this scene uh he said that stanley kubrick had a crush on the brunette and kept saying like that's enough when he kept trying to have sex with the brunette and kept going back for more <laughs> Wait, so that wasn't planned? I think he, they just like let him do it. I mean, sex scenes are awkward, right? So I feel like there's more negotiation going on. I mean, in some circumstances between like the actors and and how you get the scene done. In some circumstances, not all. Plenty there's plenty like sleazy productions that are just exploiting, you know, the actors. They don't have a say or control over what's going on. But yeah, I think also the sped up nature of that scene is is very funny and interesting to me because it's, again, more of the potential homoeroticism. You might work that scene into a reading of the movie in that way. And just to finish my point about the singing in the rain scene, the first one, uh, the fact of them potentially being seen as performing for Patrick McGee instead of, like, raping the woman, just focusing on her, but, like, focusing on making him watch is also potentially a homosocial sort of element there where it's more about doing damage to the other man and then the woman is just, who cares? 
I love all of the... Speaking of homoeroticism, look at all the graffiti in the background. Yeah, I mean, this definitely is another moment of that. Suck it and see. If it moves, kiss it. And also, like, if you really look at the dialogue here, they're talking about how he had a pain in his gulliver, which would refer to his head. And, uh, you know, I've seen people read this as, like, working on in sort of, like, double entendres. So his head, but also the head of his penis. But also referring to him having sex with these two girls. It's like, oh, you're too busy having sex with those two girls, huh? To do boy stuff? Huh? Huh? Maybe you should what not are be you in charge. Gay? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the attitude. <laughs> oh, you oh, what are you gay having sex with those girls, huh? Huh? I don't know, man. I don't know. And in order to prove he's not gay, what he's going to do is he's going to walk over and straddle Dim here and shove his codpiece right into his fucking nose. And then sit on his lap. And make eye contact. Well, this movie, it further cements Alex to a right-wing ideology. Um, because his droogs are attempting to unionize <laughs> against him. <laughs> right. Um, for fairer treatment of what they get to choose to do with their terrible rapetastic nights. Yeah. Um, There's definitely a little bit of what you're talking about, though, with, like the evaluation that like the minister of the interior gives him where he's like, he's aggressive, he's enterprising and he's ruthless. He's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, oh God, it's the same. Right. I get it. It's the same. You, that's sort of like, uh, I don't know. He'd be a good businessman too. Right. <laughs> I don't think maybe it's saying that or not. I don't know. That feels like a more shallow. <laughs> no, it is. I, uh, I was mainly joking, but Although cops do have unions. Really? Of course they do. Oh, geez. I mean, not everything does, so. No, but they have to because otherwise the state might occasionally cut their budget and they can't do that. Nah, they wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think they would. But fuck it. Give them a union anyway. Give them bargaining power. Who cares? And this is definitely, again, a very gendered experience. We're joking about it, but seriously, look at all the fucking, like, cocks and balls behind them, and then just the fact of what how they're arguing. I feel like this is very similar to, like, you know, the, the monkeys bashing each other's heads in at the beginning of 2001, right? <laughs> there are a collection of monkeys, young monkeys, and they're running around, and what Alex is about to do in this next scene coming up, a very famous scene, uh, is he's about to assert his authority in the most violently masculine way possible. And he's also going to like embrace some sort of like, I don't want to say like anti-intellectualism, but he's going to revert to a more like, I don't know. Um, I don't want to say primal, but like basic logic of motivating his behavior. He's going to talk about how like only idiots think. And then other people who are cool, they're the ones who like use inspiration, whatever the fuck that means. Yeah. And he's like, and, and that's, th this is motivated this scene, like in the movie, this is motivated by his droogs wanting to like do something bigger than can just we get more money than just nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It, but like, yeah. Like why don't we like rob a bank or something or like steal it's, the jewelry out of somebody's it's house? It's literally them having an idea yeah. that he doesn't have. And also the important thing is when he references the inspiration, what does he bring up again? The music. Yeah. My cod piece did not protect you at all. And he attacks them in their cod pieces, right? So not only does he, he violently assert his authority in the masculine way, he literally attacks their like dicks. Didn't you say they had to get their stomachs pumped or something? So that's another one. See there, he bops them on the cod piece. So the funny thing about this is that apparently, according to Malcolm McDowell in the commentary, the water in England, I don't know if this is like the Thames River or whatever, but apparently it was so disgusting and repulsive at this time that if you fell into it, you had to basically get your stomach pumped. And my my um, understanding is that I don't know if it's the same body of water, but I think we're an adjacent body of water. But my understanding is that this body of water also smelled like absolute shit. And uh, was like a real like taking one for the team moment for them to like just throw themselves into it. 
And it's just so delightful. The actors bring so much to this. All of them. They're so great. <laughs> they got the tone of this so, so precisely. All of them. It's kind of amazing to me because this is one of those movies that since it's inventing its aesthetic so much, it is really impressive to see them nail. Did they go to his mom's restaurant or they? <laughs> <laughs> this is just looks like a, like a red Robin or something. Well, because it looked like his mom just walked past them. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. There's a lot of women with um wearing like wigs that are just like some sort of really like noticeable, conspicuous like yeah. color. The funny thing is that they're drinking wine is the funny thing. <laughs> you have drugged up milk and you chose to drink some shitty wine. Come on, guys. No wonder, Alex, no wonder he they don't want to listen to you anymore. I don't know if this is intentional, but I hope it was because in the book, the one to Alex's left is the uh, one Drew that ended up not betraying him and the one that he meets in the last chapter Okay. of the book. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or a intentional framing, but I, cause I know you were saying that Kubrick actually hated the final chapter of the book, but well, when he um, first read the book, it was the version of the book that was published without the final chapter. Of course, from my knowledge, uh, that was sort of like Burgess, like, making some sort of like, you know, he was making like a concession to the publisher for some reason. Yes. It was, for the, the, original. It was the publishers. Yeah. And then he, he had wanted the final chapter in it originally, but then I guess for the American release of the book, uh, they were able to put that final chapter back in always in the American release. It was always yeah. in there. Yes. And, uh, that was the way, you know, Anthony Burgess wanted the book published. So that seems like the more conclusive, edition of the book. Of course, that's not the version Stanley Kubrick read. He lived in the UK. Uh, he, he famously <laughs> insisted on shooting all his movies in the UK and not leaving home after a certain point. Um, so he, he did not read it originally with the final chapter. And I do not think he wrote the screenplay in reference to that version either. I think he wrote the screenplay before he even read the final chapter. We were talking about just how, what great coordination on the cats that like eight out of 10 of them are licking themselves. Just the fact that they're not just all laying there. <laughs> yeah. It does make you wonder like, why is this not the scene where they talk about like, Oh, Stanley Kubrick famously having to reshoot everything a thousand times. It's like, I'm surprised there's not some sort of story about it where he's like, I have to get the cats just <laughs> right. The fucking cats. And the cats need to be sitting in a specific <laughs> specific position more. I just want like my fan fiction in my head of like Stanley Kubrick screaming at cats <laughs> to like take direction properly. And they're just like, Meow. Kubrick finally met his match. <laughs> just some like really lazy, like I don't give a shit like cat. Oh man. That would be funny. Do you think he owned a cat? I bet he did. I feel like he would. I don't know. Because there's always like the people back and forth of just like, oh, you know, it's the narcissists like uh, dogs because they like all the attention being paid to them. And then like people who are eager to please like cats because then they have an animal to please. But I've met people <laughs> that defy that completely. Yeah, so. I, I don't know. I feel like it's really hard to associate them. I mean... I know cats are more like individuals, but like, it's not like cats also don't act like affectionate either. Oh no, of course. I've met so many cats that are just affectionate love bugs who want nothing but cuddles constantly. Yeah. In many ways, cats are like more attentive to you than, than dogs can be sometimes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Great artwork. No, I have a friend of that I met <laughs> the same school we met who posts art on their Instagram. That's very similar <laughs> to the art in this house. I mean, it is like solid artwork. Yeah. Although one criticism I will see often of this movie is talking about some of the differences they make between the book and the film and talking about some of the transformations of this cat woman specifically where it's like they, I didn't really get the impression that there is like decor that is so ludicrously like sexual. Um, that's what, based on the criticism. That's their argument. Is yeah. That's not the same. 
Because I was reading some criticism that, like, well, I guess it was based on the movie, the, that, like, for her, sexuality is just, like, this artistic concept and, like, you you can, like, frame it and show it and it can be lose it at once, but, like, you can't touch it. Right. And that relates to her being an older woman. Hmm. Um, and, th- and that's why she reacts so violently to Alex actually touching her sculpture. It is definitely something that's supposed to be a comment on, like, you sort of breaking down the false binary that this movie is, seems to be thinking that everybody holds as some sort of, like, religious tenet about, like, accepted notions of sexuality where it's like, oh, look, this, like, stupid bourgeois woman is just as sexual as he is, right? But also, as we discussed in the previous screening, that's also a bullshit argument because, as far as we know, this woman didn't, like, fucking rape and murder people. <laughs> Yeah. So it's not the same actually movie. Uh, and also like, I don't know. I, d- I just don't understand truly what it's point. At. Like, I don't think it's making like a point that like John Berger makes in his really amazing <laughs> book ways of seeing where he talks about how like realist nudes are basically, he basically just reduces them in that book to just being like accepted art smut is yeah. what he talks about. And to the point where he basically says, like, it wouldn't even matter if you, like, burned one or shot one with a gun. You know who she reminds me of now that I think we're yeah, thinking about it? Who? Uh, another movie we've done on the podcast, the stepmother from uh, Beetlejuice, who just makes all the shitty. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. Don't touch that. It's a very important work of art. But whereas, I don't know, I feel like the way in which we we look at this art is different than maybe people might have at the time. Oh, God, here's the Beethoven bust. Obviously, the objects in this movie are very charged with meaning, or they want to be. Mm -hmm. So impressive to me about how, like, they transform this room with their choice of lenses. And then also just the lighting choices in this movie seem, like, very bold to me. Um, This movie is so close to looking, like, ugly and and garish as hell. And I don't just mean that with the decor, where it's, like, it's already garish because it's like this, you know, seventies retro futurism, but it's garish in a beautiful way. The decor. Um, I mean more like the lighting could be so terrible because I don't know if you've noticed it so far, Max, but there are so many source lighting moments. Like look at how hard and, and like, it's not overexposed, but like, look at that lighting, you know? No, it's very bright. Yeah. And it's it's source lighting. You see everything. There's so many blown out light sources, it seems. Or near blown out. And I find that very impressive because... Well, it's disorienting because we don't get the commentary from Alex in the movie at all. But this is the first time he's ever killed somebody. Yeah. Despite the fact that he's done horrendous things. This is also the moment he's about to lose control. Yes, completely. Oh, no. I feel like the lighting choices are very useful in this movie as just another means of, like, establishing this very, you know, like, specific tone and vision and, like, mise scene of what the movie is, where it's, like, you have a lot of fantastical design, design that it, it does not seem normal. And maybe a good way to ground that and make it feel like an actual lived-in experience for both the characters and the audience is to use a lot of source lighting that if you're not careful could just look kind of bad. I don't know. It's a very specific aesthetic. I feel like you can only really reproduce it if you're very skilled at knowing how to sort of control the way, way, uh, what your shooting looks, looks like. (laughs) So this is the scene. (sighs) This is the scene with the really fun bit of like, we had to shoot it a thousand times where uh, Alex is going to get spit on at the end of the scene. And uh, not only do they have to shoot it with one guy spitting on him like a million times to get it just right. What happened was they were that got one guy was spitting on him so much that he actually like ran out of spit. And he's like being like, Stanley, I can't do it anymore. I don't have any spit in me. And then the other guy had to come over and be like, I can do it, Stanley. And then they spit a thousand more times with this new guy until they finally got it right. So poor Malcolm McDowell getting spit on over and over and over again. That was some homoerotic shit right there. 
What, them beating him? No. <laughs> the guy getting nice and close to his face and poking it over and over again until Alex grabs his balls. I mean, yes. <laughs> There's lots of... The way in which men interact with each other in this movie is all about, like, grabbing each other's balls to assert dominance. Oh, by the way, I, I wanted to mention it before we get too far ahead in the movie, but the other really funny thing about that uh, fast motion William Tell overture moment where he's having sex with the two girls, Max, is that uh, there was this weird fear at the time from, I think, the BBFC who did not like that they were shooting that because the BBFC, as we covered in the uh, Hammer series we did last Halloween, were very involved in like pre-production and production in terms of like censorship and everything and being like, please don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And uh, they were very nervous about that scene where they were shooting it in super fast motion because, Max, their argument was, but what if the porn industry is like, it's not porn if we shoot it in super fast motion? Of course. Right. Because, you know, like, that makes sense. So it's like everyone can get away with showing obscenity in porn now, Max, as long as we speed it up to ludicrous speed. (laughs) Uh, We'll have to keep that in mind for future podcasts. Yeah. I can only, like, what the fuck logic is, like, what? What the hell were these people thinking? I also feel like this movie is very interesting to discuss in terms of its reception. It had a very interesting reception with uh, the censorship specifically, but also just because um, the book by this time had a reputation for being sort of uh, salacious and provocative and obscene. Uh, And it was also the second big book that Stanley Kubrick had adapted that had that reputation, the first one being Lolita. Um, So I feel like Warner Brothers... They had a very specific process for distributing this movie. Um, I know that in the UK, I think it was only showing at one theater for many, many months. And then when they finally went wide with the distribution, that's when they started to get like... the Hall of Justice. Yeah, this looks like stock (laughs) footage maybe. Looks like a prison though, for sure. But yeah, when they went wide with the release, that's when they got a lot of pushback. We're going to get like... 80 million emails of just actually this is the most famous prison in all of Wales, but (laughs) I'm sorry. Sorry guys. So sorry to all our Welsh viewers, but tell me what rare bit is. (laughs) What does that mean? What the fuck is toady in a hole? I'm a simple American. I don't understand these things. Do you know there's a really neat like experimental animation series from the 20s called Dreams of the Rare Bit Fiend? And apparently there's this thing about how eating rare bit gives you nightmares. No. I did find this like weird Soviet cartoon thing that was like this... It's called like talking with a dragon or something or like speaking with a fish or something that like that. That sounds great. And it's just like somebody gave somebody acid. I know people say that a lot, but like the fact that like the thing he's talking to is an ever changing form and it turns from like a goofy dragon to a fish to a train. This like never truly settles on a form is great. And I'm just like, oh, okay, this is amazing animation. If I can find it, I'll (laughs) send a link to Austin and you can all watch the fucking talking with a sea fish or whatever. I love that. (laughs) Here's another great, like, comedic performance from this sergeant guy. (laughs) To the point where this one reminds me so much of Monty Python and just that style of humor. This guy seems, like, inches away from being, like, Michael Palin or, like, John Cleese. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Don't step across that line! (laughs) (laughs) He's, his import, yeah, his performance is, it does seem very Michael Palin inspired. Jesus Christ, but yeah, that's one of my, um, that was an old, old, uh, daily show thing when John Stewart was still the showrunner, but he had a uh, John Cleese on. Okay. And he asked him what he thought of, uh, Sarah Palin. 
Okay, what did he say? And he's he he didn't answer. He just started laughing. He's like, <laughs> and he's just like, I thought Michael Palin was the funniest Palin I knew. <laughs> Sorry, it's the only the second now. Remember when that was like the weirdest and stupidest conservatives could get was just Sarah Palin existing. Now nobody even remembers who the fuck she is. Do you remember her being on uh, the Masked Singer? No. Well, that's know. good. <laughs> That's good, Max. The only thing I know about that show is that it pops up on my Twitter feed occasionally. And I'm just like, okay, cool. They put celebrities in masks. I'm so tired of just watching celebrities do things. Drew Carey was in one. I know that. I'm just like, okay. Cool. Yeah, like, like, okay. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. So, Max, let's talk about Malcolm McDowell. Why not? This is definitely the performance he's known for throughout his entire career. Yes. And uh, I think for good reason. Uh, we can relate it to um, to If, where th- it's a very similar type of performance, although Alex is very much taking it to the next level. And Alex himself seems a little bit more cartoony than his character in If. Um, but he so perfectly captures this sort of like, youthful um vaguely cherubic but cherubic in like a devilish way does that make sense impish maybe yeah um he's really terrific at doing that and uh yeah it, i think that's why that's a big part of why this movie works he, is just his casting no he comes across like yeah in the prison scenes i would say like a devilish toddler almost of just like yeah, I have the capacity to be to be a little shit, but look how cute I am right now. He in when he gets into the prison, he yeah. starts acting like super precocious. Yeah. In in a way that like movies will always try to characterize like like they're going to become a supervillain, look out. Look out, they're going to become like Hitler or whatever. It's just a boy who's like a little bit too smart or something and he has like a stupid half grin on his face. Yeah, but also in the prison he like tries to He's playing and I'm just like, oh, I'm the victim. And he seems like the character that it, in addition to one, just being a piece of shit. And like, if you met this guy in real life, he'd be like a sad boy type rapist, weirdo hipster. Um, that's, that's a comedy shot for me. Yeah. It's just that like, this is just, I'd be, are oh, you kidding me? We're going to hide his yeah genitals behind this box and then just unapologetically foof. But, this is a joke. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he's inspecting his asshole and then like <laughs> Malcolm McDowell is like talking to him with his head between his legs. This movie is comedic. No, it, it is. It really is. But also he seems like the kind of character that the people on Tumblr who like, like uh, Loki and Benedict Cumberbatch. Yes. <laughs> they would like, if this movie came out today, they'd be thirsting all over oh alex. there'd be so much alex thirst there'd be so many screenshots of him like <laughs> when he's in the doorway looking at his truant officer right when he's like leaning up against it like hi 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 and yeah. he's and he's just in his like undies there'd be so much of that there'd be so much of uh not michael palin looking up his asshole with a flashlight in his mouth i wish that were me <laughs> <laughs> No, it really, you know, I'm I'm not entirely sure what Malcolm McDowell's like opinion on his, this movie and it hit, how it has like affected his cr- career trajectory, um, but it really is like a movie, and, and his role within it is something that's deserving of being like, you know, one of those career making roles. Um, he's perfectly cast in this, and furthermore, he's clearly an actor that I think is an intelligent actor as hammy and silly as some of his later roles has been. He just is an intelligent actor. And I think he's very good at like working his way into the character and finding something that's playful about it. And if you give him room to actually do that in a way that feels meaningful and innovative, you're going to wind up with a performance like this. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not sure if his performance here really, uh, can be called his definitive performance. Yeah. Performance, especially for, uh, Home Alone for the Holiday Heist, which is obviously his greatest film of all time. Well, sure. But this is a close second. That goes without saying. <laughs> also Stanley Kubrick's best movie. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But you know what else is interesting too is uh, the Nazi imagery that we have right here of Alex with the red armband on the black. I do, I, how did that play at the time? I I'm not sure how it played at the time because um, it feels like it's smacking me in the nose now. And this is this is a movie that I feel like also is very much playing for a British audience, which is not going to be the same as the U.S. And it's like, how could somebody in the U.K. in 1970? Oh my God, it's Boris Johnson. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. I don't know. I am curious about that. There's a lot about this movie that uh, seems to be going for something that's sort of maybe a little bit more taboo or shocking, but then you have to wonder about exactly how has it aged because I'm not entirely sure if the intent was it for it to be more shocking at the time or more like silly. I know it's mixing both of those things. Or maybe it's a Protestant thing that I don't know about. I wasn't raised Protestant. What do you so, mean by that? Well, the, the, or the Church of England type thing where like the red armband, like maybe it's just a coincidence type thing and that's just a commonplace thing. But maybe it's a coincidence that it's like the Nazis. I don't think so. Okay. No, I'm, I mean, there's so much Nazi stuff in this. Yeah. It's unavoidable. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, we have him being a Roman soldier. But. Yeah. And also it's it's not just the Nazis, of course, but it's like, what is the through line between the Roman soldier whipping Jesus and the Nazis? You're, they're using the imagery. Oppressed, yeah, the yeah. oppressive authoritarian government beating the Jewish minority. Hmm. 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 Just as a general rule in history, if your government's just like, we need to be like the Roman Empire, it's time to ditch your fucking government. Yeah, maybe <laughs> not. Although we, this is maybe our favorite outfit of his in the movie. Oh, yeah, snake nipples. <laughs> a crocodile face nipples. And if you look, everybody, you see that his entire like tunic or whatever is like crocodile leather. He, we were saying that he looks a little bit like our favorite character from another movie we've done on the show. Don't you rope me in with this. Mortal Kombat, he looks like Reptile. Reptile? Do you remember that song? <laughs> How's it go, Max? Mortal Kombat? No, the uh, Reptile one. Don't they just say Reptile. And then it starts with like a beat or something. What the fuck are you talking? I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> For some reason, I had a uh, Kesha's cannibal stuck in my head when you said that. I eat boys up breakfast and lunch. Then when I'm thirsty, I drink their blood. Wow, I won't mess with her. <laughs> don't you dare shame Kesha. She's the voice of our generation and deserves to be treated as such. Yeah. Okay. So here we have the preacher character. And I think now is a good time to bring up what I talked about in the opening of the preacher here. Even if it's obvious to us and to uh, Michael Palin (laughs) and everybody else that Alex is just reading the Bible to suck up to him. I think the preacher either out of naivety or just like wanting to believe that men can choose to be good is trying to encourage Alex to keep doing this. But Alex still wants the easy way out of this Ludicolo technique. But the preacher doesn't approve of it because it takes the possibility away from choice. And that is a religious thing of just like, you have to choose the Lord's way and reject sin. And that is what Burgess was going for in the original book that if you just have a clockwork, yeah, like you're a clockwork orange, but I guess what I'm trying to say is does the movie buy into this idea because it's a simple thing of just like you mean with the preacher i well, don't think so the preacher doesn't the preacher is not the ludovico technique I, you're yeah. asking me if the movie buys into the preacher's point that he's raising which i don't think so i don't think that's entirely true yeah. like the movie allows different characters to offer different opinions but the movie never actually allows any character to have any sort of moral authority it always reveals them to be some sort of heinous hypocrite or something or there's something about them that like you know totally forces you to reject the seriousness of their opinion or question it. Besides the preacher, though, but I think that might just be because he doesn't feature prominently. Like, this is his big scene. And, I don't think that's true, though. And then he objects later after the technique is done. I feel like in this moment you see the preacher potentially being 
framed, there's this very interesting comment that he makes about like, you know, certain things happen, young Alex, when you're deprived of the company of women. And then Alex is like, well, you know, it's not that. Uh, it's really not that. But I also think that's interesting because uh, it is going to forward, again, the same sort of logic about women that other characters have in this movie. The problem with that is, again, like other subtextual things in this movie is that maybe it's un- inconsistent because the rest of the movie seems to also think that way. It's very... I don't think we've come out and, and really stated at this point like how thoroughly this movie just takes women as like objects see as window dressing yeah, goodness comes from women. goodness is chosen when a man cannot choose he ceases to be a man that's the thesis statement of the movie of the book maybe i don't think that's the thesis of the movie because i don't think the thesis the movie has a thesis i think it's confused maybe it wants it to be that but i don't think it actually hammers that that sort of point home and I don't think it allows the preacher to be morally upright enough to actually yeah. be like the character who's like, but think of his choice. <laughs> Cause again, after the preacher <laughs> objects, I'm sorry, the, just the boredom of this, the outdoor time of let's walk in a circle. Yeah. But no, after the preacher protests, when uh, he's, he's demonstrating the results of the technique, we don't see him again. He's yeah. gone. So, so much for that. And then, of course, the movie ends on such a definitive note that it's like, how are we supposed to be feeling about this ending? If the preacher showed back up towards the end, then maybe we might feel that his his perspective feels a little bit more weighty. But in the end, the only thing we can really feel is like, well, Alex is here. Wow. Life, he did it. Life is shit. I mean, I guess it's great if you're Alex, but if you're like, you don't want to be an insane murder rapist, then cool. And that's why the movie ultimately seems sort of nihilistic because it's like, it doesn't have an opinion. (laughs) You know, it wants to show you that people are hypocrites and that there's, it wants to introduce moral ambiguity into everything that's going on. And it also wants to show you that morality is like, is a product of like discourse in culture, not the other way around. Morality isn't this tangible thing we can interact with. It, it's something that these people, you know, uh, sort of project onto people and events because it fits their political needs, right? And that life is so ambiguous, naturally, that everyone winds up a hypocrite because when you project that morality, you might be right in some ways, but there's other ways you're going to be wrong. And um, the movie puts that idea out there, and then it's just like, yeah, that's right. We live in a society. We live in that society, and it's bad. <laughs> it doesn't say anything else after that, really. And I think it it sort of puts those ideas out there in a way that is very formally like rigorous and impressive and kind of sophisticated. But uh, and even what it, does it amount to? That's the thing. like, Because I know Burgess won... He had, uh, he said that it, he, he didn't like the fact that a clockwork orange is basically the fact that like the book that was going to be remembered as his like pinnacle. Sure. Because it got the big Kubrick movie, but I'm wondering now, cause I've been yeah drowning on about how the final chapter for me, at least is the scent. Like it sort of ties together the moral core of the book. But I'm wondering, with the way Kubrick adapted this movie. Max, shut your bleeding hole. Yes. (laughs) Like, the way Kubrick adapted this movie, if we got, like, a flash forward to ten, like, five or ten years later and met the other Droog as a normal, boring adult with a wife and they were going to a boring party to play boring word games with their boring friends, like, would that be a better ending for this movie? And I don't think so because like cinema, like cinema is a different language and you have to tell the tale a different way. And reading that in a book can leave you with like a wonderful feeling at the end of this, like (laughs) strange and awful adventure you've gone on. But like cinematically you want to end on a, like not necessarily a high note, but just like a bombastic note. Something you want, you want something to happen. 
yes. in front of the camera. Not just yeah. him sitting at a bar by himself being like, huh, maybe I can change. And you could describe yeah. the act of sitting at a bar in a specific way, but showing somebody sitting at a bar, it yeah. has to be very contextual for it to be exciting in the same way. So if you wanted to end the movie in that way, you might want to change many other things about the movie leading up to that scene. So there's no real easy way to just slap it on at the end. But look, he's learned. He's behind the white line. So one other, one other really interesting thing about this movie to me is uh, how it also seemed to like be like a self-fulfilling prophecy about like its own critical response to itself. Um, the level of like censorship and reaction to this movie was like severe. It was really severe. Uh, more so in the UK than the US. And I feel like this movie was kind of a precursor to uh, things like the video nasties in the UK in the 80s, which for people who don't know, in the 80s, the UK had these very like, frankly, insane and, and insanely like draconian censorship laws against things like horror movies or things that were seen to be like, you know, uh, socially depraved or whatever. And uh, there were serious punishments doled out for Things as simple as owning a copy of like Evil Dead, I think could land you in prison. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And uh, that's how extreme it got. But I feel like a movie like this is sort of maybe um, leading up to it uh, because it got so severe that at one point they uh, actually just decided to pull it from theaters. And uh, I'm not entirely sure about how that worked, but my understanding is that Kubrick somehow was able to get himself into a deal with Warner Brothers where he had some not insubstantial control over distribution of the movie. So he was able to sort of go to Warner Brothers and be like, let's remove this from all theaters in the UK, which was interesting because it was actually making a lot of money up to that point is my understanding. He just decided to pull it out and it was banned shortly thereafter after they made dis the decision to remove it from distribution. But the interesting thing is that it was then not shown in the UK, I think until the 21st century. Yeah, that's ridiculous though. Yeah. That's crazy. This comes across as a Monty Python thing, though. Yeah, his just level of commitment to, to doing everything in the most like dramatic way possible. <laughs> the doctors are just like, okay, so you're here. <laughs> you want to drop them off? Or? or Yeah. Can I get you a cup of coffee, sir? Or um, Is this a medical problem you have where you constantly have to like walk upright like this? And, we have and a proctologist. You can. <laughs> you, we, we have modern medicine. You don't have to keep doing this to yourself. Maybe somebody should look up your ass rather than you <laughs> look up somebody else's. There's a lot of problems up there. Wow. It's I don't think I ever realized how long this one shot of them signing release forms was. Well, yeah, it's accentuated by the two doctors in back just walking up the stairs and casually going through the building together. Why is this shot so long? What is going on? I think it's just to show how like stupid and how much paperwork and bureaucracy is going on right here. You're really hammering it home. Thank God we cut out of that. <laughs> I love how Alex is like now performing uh, his new masculine identity as like this weird military man. <laughs> well, they can't, so they can't yell it like it's him overperforming it because like, oh, you want me to do this? I'm going to do it with some dramatic flair. Yeah. I really do feel like if you look at this performance, it makes this performance in Tank Girl all the better. Yes. Uh, because you really do say, see the same sort of playful, intelligent mind of the actor at work. Um, Malcolm McDowell was just great at doing both of those. He seemed like he was having fun in Tank Girl too, though. Oh God, he, his performance of that is really great. And also like, I don't know, it. the characters are not unrelated. We actually talked about in that commentary track, that episode, about how in Tank Girl there might be visual cues that are references 
to his performance in this. You see in certain moments, he has the same, like, you know, yeah. eyelash piece. Sorry about that. <sighs> Max's phone. I ruined everything by being popular. All right, back at back to one. <laughs> okay, let's start the podcast over. This is an interesting character that I think you mentioned earlier, uh, where she's the only woman to be treated in this way as having any sort of expertise or exercising any sort of agency over Alex. Yeah. What do you think about her? She's a woman, but like I did, yeah, she's the only one with power about it. Like Alex keeps trying to inquire and charm her and do everything that he always does. And she's just like fully aware of all of his bullshit. Yeah. And just like, no, I'm in control. Don't stop stop it just do this oh here's another fun behind the scenes moment so alex is about to be injected in the ass with like a hypodermic needle now of course they actually also did this for real why to be thorough they ended up not using that shot in the movie though and uh, alex was very concerned because he's like this person who is the nurse is like not a real nurse and he's like, she's just going to get me in the wrong place in my ass. My ass is going to swell up a thousand times the size. <laughs> and he was absolutely right uh, because she got it wrong. And then he had a giant welt on his ass for like weeks. Fun. And they didn't even use it. He got physically fucking tortured and abused in this movie. Speaking of which. Yes. <laughs> Very painful for him. This famous Ludovico technique scene. Um, and uh, this is an actual medical device. And this is a doctor. Uh, putting these brackets in his eyes. Very uncomfortable looking. Yes, but Incredibly you should never painful. use it like this, right? No, they they kind of bastardized what this... I don't know what this machine is for. I don't know. If you're having some sort of horrifying eye surgery like James Joyce, yeah. where he had... I assume it's for when you're unconscious and they're doing something on you. I don't know. Like put you to sleep and then they can open your eye that way. I, I really do not know. But I do know that you're not supposed to be sitting up and you're definitely not supposed to be watching like fucking bright lights and TV. Oh no, it's death wish. (laughs) That's the uh, in pirate hats. That's the thing about like death wish movies. Like when all the gangs are like just punks of different ethnicities. Yeah. And they're just wearing pirates. Those movies are, I mean, those movies are made by Michael winner who is, has this weird quote that I don't even know what the fucking context for it is or what it means. But there's this thing that I always think about him where he said like in an interview or something about how his like politics are to the right of the Nazis. Yeah. Which, what the fuck does that even mean? I don't even understand that. (laughs) He's also a weirdo sex pervert. He is. Uh, And uh, his movies are all about like older white men shooting these taking yeah taking back their what's theirs from (laughs) these bands of punks from these brown punks yeah from someplace in the mediterranean or the middle east (laughs) or some other place who have raped and killed their women yes yeah michael winter sounds like a terrible human being although death wish 3 is still funny unfortunately now max Let's go back to the idea that we mentioned earlier and something that a lot of criti- critics like to talk about, the idea that this movie is almost like its own meta, like Ludovico technique scene for the audience and other characters in the movie. Okay. Right? Uh, one thing that a lot of people talk about is the thing that makes that singing in the rain scene so famous is how it recontextualizes that song and how it, in a Ludovico technique way, now, when we think of singing in the rain, we must now be nauseous because we think of this famous, terrible rape scene. I, I, I think I've told that story where I was in a film analysis class and we were watching Singing in the Rain, but I had mentioned to the professor before that I enjoyed A Clockwork Orange, but I had never seen Singing in the Rain before. Right. Also, I was stoned because I went to that class stoned a lot, but, but I was watching this movie and... I heard singing in the rain for the first time and it was like a genuinely delightful experience to seeing it in the context of the movie. Right. So I was smiling like ear to ear, like, wow, this is such a delightful, genuinely happy song. And the professor comes up to me and he's just like, you sick bastard. And I'm just like, no, he slap you. No, you fucking pervert. But (laughs) it does. It's recontextualized it for everybody forever, which is kind of sad, but 
I mean, not entirely, because it's Singing in the Rain is a better movie than this movie. Yeah. I think of Singing in the Rain, the movie, more than this, frankly. Um, but it is the fact that th- there's a reason why that scene is so famous, and it is partly because of that song. But also, it would mean more if it was somehow part of a, like a cohesive subtext in this movie where it's like, okay, you want to reveal that our conventional accepted notions of virtue and, and uh, what's good versus what's bad are somehow hypocritical, right? Okay. Yeah. Movie go do it. But then also it's like the movie kind of stacks the deck in how it's examining that. There's a lot of situations where it feels like it's just like false, false. It feels like a lie. So the comparisons being made question. Yeah. You're younger than me. Did you ever play DDR growing up? Dance Dance Revolution? Yes. That's not an age thing. They make new versions of that all the time. No, they don't. Yeah, uh-huh. they do. Those are all over the place. But um, are you talking about how these Nazis are about to dance? What are you talking about? <laughs> There's a song called uh, Speed Over Beethoven, which is <laughs> this like techno Euro trash version of one of Beethoven's symphonies <laughs> with like cute chibi <laughs> voices over it. So I'm just imagining like when Alex is yelling about <laughs> this they're just playing speed over beethoven that was a weird thing i think in the 60s and 70s which the composer for this movie it's a great score but the composer uh wendy carlos who would actually work with kubrick multiple times again um or at least with the shining i know uh they worked with him again but uh they they had reached some renown previously not working in film scores because they released some sort of like synthesized bach record and it seems maybe i'm wrong but like it seems like synth versions of or like updated techno like technologized or whatever term you want to come up with like covers of classical music were really popular in the 60s and 70s as also like a gateway to like weird prog rock things yeah i'll I'll send you (laughs) please don't Please, I, I Listener, can live without listeners, it. Listeners, go listen to Speed Over Beethoven from DDR. It's so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a very weird trend. I feel like a lot of that does not, it's not the same. Oh, no, it's not. That that was like early 2000s shitty Euro trash techno mixed with Beethoven. Okay, but. so that's not from that era. It's not like um, Mannheim Steamroller. No. Versions of like Christmas songs or whatever. <laughs> I hate Mannheim Steamroller so much. DDR in general is mainly just like old school. Like if it's older music, it's like old school disco or funk music. And then early 2000s, you're a trash tech. No. Oh, here's an interesting part. If we're going to talk about the music in Beethoven specifically um, is again, I feel like the movie's argument seems to be that there's, you know, that Beethoven didn't do anything wrong specifically, but the reason why maybe the Beethoven is the music in this backing track for this Ludovico Technique movie that they're playing for him is they're showing him the Nazi stuff that he should be, you know, reviled at. And there's that association between Beethoven and, you know, Nazis and the fascism and the terrible things that happened. Um, And I feel like this is a beginning moment of like hypocritical attitudes in the uh, institution. Not the first one we've seen, but one of the ones where Alex actually like articulates it, where he's like, Beethoven didn't do anything. I'd really like to not vomit when I listen to Beethoven. Right. But then they're like, Oh, it's part of the punishment boy. And uh, I think the choice was all yours. Yeah. It it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like what the fuck are you? What? (laughs) It's just like a non sequitur. What choice are you talking about? Look at his fucking arms. He's like tied down in every way possible. But yeah, I do think that's an important moment is, is how this movie treats the music and uh, how the music is something that it seems to argue doesn't have any inherent morality, but is instead something that is, uh, you know, transcendent of politics, perhaps, and then can be repurposed or reused or reappropriated by different movements that then can do bad things, which I don't know how much I agree with this movie's take on it. Um, But also, like, I don't know, I wanted to do more with that. It's like proving that, that, like, cultural objects 
can be appropriated for different means, but it's like, but what now? What do you, what do you have to say after that? Yeah. And the fact that it doesn't go anywhere strong enough with that then makes me like doubt whether or not it's actually doing that in the first place. Well, if we, the Beethoven, like it can be, I would say the through lines it expresses are joy for Alex. And then you could say violence. Um, and it's associated in the beginning with the violence or just like after his night out of insanity and you have it there. And then at the end it starts playing in his head once he realizes he's free to do whatever he wants again. Although, but, okay. So this is a whole can of worms we're opening. Yeah. I guess the first thing to say is that part of my thinking about that in terms of like the movie, maybe arguing that the music is transcendent of politics is like maybe not, properly assessing the history of Beethoven either. I'm not like a music critic or an expert on like music history. Same. But like Beethoven is a, his music is, comes out of like a, in my mind, like a romantic German tradition, but also that carries weight with it over time. And then even in this world becomes to be like, you know, appreciated by Alex himself in ways that are seemed to be like fascistic and oppressive. Look at the way Alex shuts dim up when that woman is singing it. Yeah. It's very much like somebody in a crowd being like, shh, be quiet. I'm listening. You know, it's not exactly the same, but it's a similar instinct. And uh, the way in which he engages with it is this very specific sort of relationship. But the other part of what you're talking about, too, is the fact that this movie seems to go back and forth between Beethoven and then Rossini music, which, again, I'm not an expert, but Beethoven in his romantic tradition and how he would make music is that every time he would compose a piece of music, it was like this, this like laborious, like strenuous, very meticulously crafted jewel that he would work on and work on until it was perfect, but it had to be perfect. Whereas Rossini in the way he would make music and Rossini is the one who composed like thieving magpie and whatnot, um, which is maybe equally as famous in this movie as the use of Beethoven's ninth symphony. Uh, the way Rossini would compose music, it was very improvisational. So he would, when he was performing it or whatever, they would change it or alter it to the needs of whatever was going on at the venue where they were performing it that night. But it wasn't this holy grail that he could not touch once it was composed. So it's very differing, almost you could say opposite attitudes towards creation and the thing that you've created. And I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? What's the subtext of these things alternate? Cause it could not be more different from one another. And the movie, this, this thing right here. Oh, the stepping on him. Well, just in general, like none of this proved like if I was the audience member or like a member of the press, I'd be like slightly skeptical that like this guy didn't, wasn't just like, Oh yeah, sure. I'll lick a guy's boot and not rape this woman on stage. Yeah. The, it's weird that the, so I don't have to be in <laughs> jail for 14 years. The, the, the minister of the interior is like, he's not hypnotized. Trust us. <laughs> it's like, Okay. I love how awkwardly they're sitting though. Somehow the, these actors are so perfectly capturing like the awkwardness of just like bullshit politicians when they're like attending a gathering or something and they have to look like real human beings while they're engaging with it, but they can never fully succeed. Max. No, it's never they're, fully they're succeed. not comfortable in their uh, human skin outfits. Yes. <laughs> All the reptiles. They're like, I need to get my tail out because this is uncomfortable. My bath of virgin blood isn't, Oh my God, it's the chick from Blade Runner 2049. Speaking of virgin blood, Max, uh, <laughs> This woman is actually the wife of one Ralph Bates. Do you know who that is? No. That's the guy who was not Christopher Lee in the second Hammer Dracula movie. Oh, okay. And it was stupid. <laughs> Ralph Bates isn't Christopher Lee. What the fuck? That was a terrible decision on their part. I know they killed Christopher Lee, and maybe they didn't know, like, just come up with some bullshit retcon reason to resurrect him, please. But, like, it's not fun to watch Peter Cushing, like, duel with Ralph Bates. <laughs> Like, what, what are you talking about? Don't do that. This is like, yeah, maybe that was just like the point of 
Sorry, I'm just realizing now that the giant holographic woman in Blade Runner 2049 looks exactly in space. <laughs> looks exactly like her. Okay. That I have no point for that. It's just something. Is there any connection? It looks like she's wearing a specific type of wig, which is maybe like a part of like futurism, but that's the only thing I, I've I've not seen that movie. Well, so oh uh, no, there is a there is a point that's similar to this where she like because she's like a billboard advertisement. It's not an important scene, but like she like reaches down and touches him. And it's basically the point in the movie where he realizes he's completely alone. But perfect. Just like Alex realized that he can never touch the titties again. No more titties. Can he touch his own titties? That is a good question. Yeah. Can he masturbate? Uh, probably not. And like, so is sex off limits to him now? Because like, there was nothing there that like... <laughs> it's fucking awkward politician people. She was just naked. Like she came up to him with her tits out and... He gasped when he tried to touch them. This is also kind of funny. The gratuitous bowing yeah. as a way to make the politicians comfortable. It's like, no, guys, I'm not just standing here naked. It was a performance. See? Yeah. See, I'm bowing. See? Clap for me. Clap for me in my titties. Not saying that stripping and sex work isn't art, but all she did was walk out with her tits out and then go backstage. The fact is of the matter, Max, is that they must make a point of saying that it is yeah. art. In performance, because that is the only way it is acceptable for this group of people. I know. I just wanted to clarify for us. Sure. No, there's, there's really, that's the thing. There's no way to really relate this movie to real world moral situations often, because it feels like this movie just does not engage with the real world in an honest way. And by that, I mean, it's like, you can't, you can't like have Alex like rape people and then attempt to then make like comparisons morally yeah. to things other people do in the way that this movie does. Self-interest, the fear of physical pain. Grotesque act of self-abasement. He licked a guy's boot three times. <laughs> Is that what you'd call it? I've seen more grotesque asks in the last 10 minutes of this movie. Padre. <laughs> what the fuck? You're British. Do British people say Padre? I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't notice that. Yay, he's going to get crucified. Aren't we excited? Now, Max, do you think somebody could remake this movie successfully? Or not remake, per se, because this is an adaptation, but, like, readapt the material? Yeah. Honestly, yes. Um, Would you be interested in that, depending on the person? Depending on the person, yes. If it was just... Because I know there's plenty of people who would declare blasphemy, and honestly, I'm sick of remakes in general, so it's not on, like, the top of my list. If they, right. If they announced this tomorrow, I wouldn't be like, wooey! But the problem is if you want to make your own thing, you'd have to completely strip away the sense of style this movie has. And you can replace it with your own style. That's fine. But it's going to be very hard to upstage this movie in terms of style. And if you do keep the style, then people are just going to say that you're ripping off Kubrick and you didn't add enough. If you don't, it's going to be hard to make a style that in this way, this movie almost does not completely distracts you from the horrifying, horrifying truth. That is this movie. Also, this movie, like a lot of things about it is the straight on rape and the misogyny at times aren't going to come like age well today. Well, it's not so much about the aging of it. It's like, what are we saying? Yes. It's like, do I have any interest in watching like, Oh God, here comes the moral ambiguity. He's a rapist. Yeah. But he's got some good points about like society. <laughs> like, okay. Like this is so stupid. You it, know, like it's like the guy, have you seen that video? The guy freaking out that Joker didn't win best picture. <laughs> <laughs> And he like explains <laughs> what all is the... more relevant to our society today than Joker. Oh, I hate this person more than anyone. 
Um, <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, I hate you so much, you stupid asshole. Uh, no. And but you're going to come across as that guy if you don't do it real well. So, well, theoretically, yes, I think you could do this movie very well. You have to totally reinvent. You'd have to be Kubrick level to do it again, I would say. Well, the thing is, you would have to change the parameters to something that's more sophisticated than the original movie. Because the real thing is that this movie doesn't succeed at what it does. I don't think it does. Um, it succeeds in terms of design. It succeeds in terms of technical prowess and acting prowess and... Um, you know, music, it, it's so amazing in all those different ways. But also it's like it just does not really make any sort of truly profound moral points. It's a very sophisticated movie, but in reading a lot of criticism about this movie, it's like, wow, there's so much to learn from this movie. But ultimately a lot of what you have to learn is the ways in which it remains ambiguous or not entirely clear or profound. Yeah. Even while it does successfully use different techniques of storytelling to create interesting associations and start interesting patterns. There's a lot of subtext that you can dig into this movie, but it's just, it's not going to amount to a ton unless you're able to change it a lot. And you also have to change like what the aesthetic means. You're talking about like how style is merely something about like, you know, is, are you just aping off of Kubrick or are you successfully innovating to the point where you're able to have this stand on its own? But it's also like the style is supposed to have subtext because style is something that is supposed to not be innocent yeah. from hypocrisy and ideology. It's all part of the same thing. And this movie, I feel like on its own, doesn't truly engage with that to the point where it would need to to be successful. And the real thing is like, even if you did make it really, really successfully, it is the thing where you're talking about where it's like, what is needed at this point, maybe? Like, is there not a more interesting way to put some sort of conventions or ideas that we take for granted about what is moral or virtuous through like a stress test than to just do like the thing with the rape again? Yeah. It's like we... And also, I would just rather those resources go to a new original... Yeah, like stylized, interesting movie than remaking a Clockwork Orange, a movie that's already gotten enough clout for several lifetimes. Yeah. Why do we need to remake that? Just fucking do something new. You could probably do the same themes and questions that this seemed to be guiding this movie, even though it doesn't seem to answer them quite as well. You could probably pose all those same questions in a way that's more relevant today by just thinking up a new premise, even if you did wind up taking elements from a Clockwork Orange. Yeah. Yeah which a lot of movies have. So yeah, why not? Some people even use parts of it for their, uh, AOL instant messenger username. Uh, Isn't that right, Max? No, it was just my steam name. <laughs> Somehow the house looks uglier. I mean, you're to be fair. Your humble narrator is much more prevalent in the book. What? Your humble narrator. Oh, it's, it's much more prevalent in the book. It's like no, I wasn't talking about your your username or whatever. I'm talking about like the house. Oh. I said the house is uglier. I think the joke was that like every time you see the house, it was like a different thing. Do you think you'd go insane living in a house like this? <laughs> of course, we. Uh, by the way, can I just interrupt myself and say that this actor we didn't mention it. Of course, he would be in uh, The Shining very famously is Delbert Grady. And I think he's the only Kubrick actor he worked with to be in three of Kubrick's movies. Mm -hmm. I think he was also in Barry Lyndon. Jeez. Not many people can put up with him for that long. I think actors generally loved working with Stanley Kubrick. Only he, he in the last like 30 or not 30, but like 20 years of his career only made like four movies. I mean, after this, he made Barry Lyndon, Shining, Full Metal Jacket, and Eyes Wide Shut, and that's it. Yeah. Another really interesting thing about this movie is really how cheap they made this movie for. It's really astonishing. They made this for very little money compared to uh, some of his other budgets. I believe this was the first project he did after his like famous Napoleon project didn't come to fruition. Um, I'd have to double check on that, but I believe this is what he turned to after it really looked like it wasn't going to come out. I think uh, the Russian, the famous Russian director, Sergei Bondarchuk or whatever, 
uh, had directed a uh, version of Napoleon's life story or whatever. He was an, a director of epics. Um, I actually own the Criterion version of his War and Peace uh, okay. adaptation, which is really like astonishing and huge in its production value. Uh, but he directed a version, of, I think it was called Waterloo. Um, but I assume it's another epic. I've never seen it, but it came out like a year or so before this. And uh, that's why studios started to be scared because they're like, oh, we don't want to like saturate the market for like Napoleon biopics. I think one is enough for now. Yeah. So Kubrick shelved everything he was doing with that and he got to work with this movie. In fact, originally I believe uh, he was potentially going to do it beforehand but felt like uh he he didn't want to be known as like the person doing the provocative books yeah well i i I guess like i'm thinking now like besides the house sets honestly and how like strangely and extravagantly they're decorated you don't need a lot of budget for a lot of things in this movie and it's going to be more expensive for and like you said malcolm mcdowell wasn't a big actor at the time um and you don't have any like real big names in this movie so like you don't need huge amounts of sets or huge amount of props or costume design. And a lot of the costumes and the flashbacks were just stolen from other movies, I think. Oh, you mean in the scenes where he's imagining stuff? Yeah. It definitely looks like it. I really think the thing that sews it all together is it is just like a unified vision though, where it's like that you can tell they really thought through all the locations they would use when they built sets, they were like, we're going to build it in this way. And also I really think the lighting style somehow really ties everything together. Um, If you really slow down and look at like the Corova milk bar stuff, you can maybe start to look at how maybe some of it looks potentially cheap ish. But if you really focus on it too, it's like the decor is so perfectly I don't know, arranged and lit so as to mask that, but also make it look lived in. It's just really, really, I think it is a a sort of combination of lighting and then set design and, and then just knowing how to arrange the objects so that you can make it look really, really, uh, I don't know, convincing. Yeah. And it does. And like, as I was saying the other day, it does feel, um, and punk rock in general took a lot of aesthetic cues from this movie. Oh, sure. But like punk in general, like it, like the, the Corova milk bar feels less cheap to me and just sort of as an authentic thing. Yeah. Cause I've been to punk clubs where I'm just like, yeah, pretty much. It's had a ripple effect. Yeah. Throughout history. And, uh, the interesting thing about that too, is like they somehow create, like visuals for the locations and sets where it's like, it really does seem like an abstract idea that they're somehow able to make concrete in real life where it's like they, they have these different ideas of what the Corova milk bar is going to look like, but it really, when you watch it for the first time and the way it hits you just visually, it's almost like you leave with an impression of it that's stronger than what you're actually seeing potentially almost in the manner of like a Soviet film montage, but not, through the use of actual montage, just because everything is so evocative that you remember it very strongly and it sort of grows in your memory. Oh, here's the first of the, uh, well, not the first, the second of the repetition scenes, we should say. This movie has an interesting structure that reminds me a lot of the structure of Eyes Wide Shut, where the characters go around through their lives or whatever. It's kind of episodic in the first part. Then there's like a second part, which is a dividing part, which is... um, it sort of separates the first, the first half from the second half, right? There's a there's a like intermission, sort of, where the character goes through some sort of fundamental change, and then in the third part of the movie, the character sort of re- returns and revisits all the things that they've explored and interact with in the first part, except now it's different because of what happened in the middle. It's just like a tripartite structure, yeah. right? So we get. Malcolm returning home. He's going to get kicked out by his parents and that guy, Joe. Yeah. The homeless guys beat him up. And And here we get the the two of his gang members are now police with the officer number six, six, five and six, six, seven. Is that a joke? 
You think that has to be Joe Gaius, right? Six six five, six six seven. That's two on the nose. <laughs> what a weird police car. Maybe it's standard in England. I don't think so. That looks like fucking Crocodile Dundee was driving that. And then this scene is a total aesthetic departure. It is weird. Yeah, look how garish and like I mean, different this looks. I guess because they they have to use natural lighting for this, but like, sure. But it's just so visually like dull and drab compared to everything else. I mean, it to- makes total sense. Yeah, no, it, and it kind of feels like a snuff film, <laughs> honestly. But like. But it's also, I think, the first time that we really get a glimpse of, like, nature or natural landscapes. I guess, yeah. Because we we were outside before, but it was, like, pitch black, so we didn't see anything. Yeah, and it... Beforehand, it seems like the very... They use trees for, like, framing. Mm -hmm. Like, shots. Like, they frame the house as they creep into it. Um, But, like you're saying, it's sort of out of our field of view. Whereas this time, we're going into nature, and it's just, like, gross and terrible. This is the only like non artificial setting I think that we'd really go to in the movie. Everything else is like man-made. It's a cell, it's a house, it's a bar, it's whatever. And the fun fact about this is that it was fucking freezing on this day. That's like the, just the ubiquitous comment that you always hear in these commentary tracks from people who made the movie where they're like, God, it was fucking cold that day. You would have no idea in the movie how fucking cold it was. I was freezing. Of course, this one, it's maybe potentially different again because Malcolm McDowell has to get, like, fucking drowned. (laughs) I was listening to some comedian and he was talking about, is like, I was doing a sketch for a show where I had to get fake waterboarded. But the thing they didn't tell me is when you get fake waterboarded, you get waterboarded. (laughs) For real, it's just that you can tell them, please stop, I feel like I'm drowning. And it's just like, this goes on for a long ass time. (laughs) It's just like absurdly long. Again, it becomes a joke where it's like, well, he's fucking dead now, right? It's like, no, actually. So let's talk about a few other things, Max. Like? Uh, One other weird pattern I noticed watching it for this week is uh, Stanley Kubrick has a weird thing of using masks in his movies. Maybe the most influential use of masks in his uh, entire filmography is the use of them in The Killing, which, again, we've already done on the show. Uh, But that's, like, as far as I know, the first instance of, like, a robbery heist movie where they wear, like, clown masks and everything, which has become an iconic thing uh, and introduced a whole, like... I thought The Dark Knight introduced that. Oh, yeah. When the Joker robbed the bank. It's not that... Max, trust me. It's definitely not that Christopher Nolan reveres Stanley Kubrick and like <laughs> masturbates to, to the killing I thought, no, every I, night. I, I, I think it'd be super smart and intellectual of him to do that. <laughs> I thought Christopher Nolan went back in time and inspired Stanley Kubrick. Oh, you're right. Cause he's actually smarter because <laughs> Batman is superior to the killing. Cause he dresses like a animal. I mean, the Joker would beat the shit out of Dr. Strangelove. So I'm just saying <sighs> in a fight who would win. <laughs> I mean, what's more relevant to society right now, Max? Dr. Strangelove or the movie about the Joker dancing down fucking stairs? I don't like, there's so many memes about Joker. I'm like, I didn't bother to see the fucking movie. Can like, we just let this go? Yeah. Can we just forget about this stupid ass nonsense? We've come around so far on the irony that you all just are clowns. <laughs> it's the thing. You just are. It's not even like... It's not like that's the best meme that's come out of that. What the clown makeup <laughs> it, face? No, is this person like demanding that the Joker be freed, holding up the sign that says "We are all clowns"? <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. It's an actual thing, a frame from the movie. You know what? We more all homoeroticism. Are. Jesus. Well, you know what? The fun fucking thing about Austin this guy, Powers is here. Not Austin Powers. He's Austin Powers. He's Darth Vader. Yes, true. That's the other fun fact that all these film bros bring up about this movie. Although the weird thing, the really weirder thing is that Stanley Kubrick had both people who were Darth Vader in his movies. True. Cause James Earl Jones was in the airplane and Dr. Strangelove. And of course now we have 
Daniel Prowse, Dylan Prowse, whatever this fucking guy's name is. I don't know, but they don't like to let him talk in any movie that he's in. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, his appearance here reminds me of like Arnold Schwarzenegger's appearance in The Long Goodbye. And you made a joke about the homoeroticism. It's like, yeah, he was, he's wearing spandex for some reason. But also, like, it is interesting to look at this at how, like, Patrick McGee's wife has been replaced by a bodybuilder who is in the same spot. Yeah. It's like, okay. Hmm. And we're going to repeat the entire scenario again here. Only reversed. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that Stanley Kubrick, I think it'd be interesting to look through his movies and compare the way he uses masks. Uh, of course, he uses it in The Killing. Um, of course, they also wear masks here. Again, it's associated with criminal activity. Uh, maybe the next part you could uh, associate masks is that one bit in The Shining where that dog dude is blowing the other person um, through his mask, which is yes. interesting. And then, of course, finally, famously... Hey, listen, ask those furries. They make those masks custom design to do whatever you want. Uh, no. <laughs> um, but keeping in the realm of sex, all those people fucking in masks and eyes wide shut. Hmm. So there is a bit of a progression there. And, of course, those people are certainly all criminals. Those are like the Jeffrey Epstein creeps who live in Greenwich. So what you're saying is Stanley Kubrick furry confirmed. Uh, well, there must have been a reason he didn't get mad at all those cats. And, so, and the monkeys in the beginning of 2001. I think we're starting <laughs> to th see a thread here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You're going to oh, find out in the lost Kubrick film that's going to come to service. The lost Kubrick film, a.k.a. the butthole cut <laughs> of cats. Is Cats out on like any streaming service yet? Can Let's I... not talk about it. I'm done talking about furries or cats or buttholes or anything. Are you though? Yeah, I, I am. I really am, Max. <sighs> Believe and... it or not, I mean that. Uh, so let's talk about something else. Let's compare this to another movie that we've done on the show that no. I think would be interesting to look at how this character relates to an audience and actually found an audience sort of in a cult classic sort of way. So let's talk about Scarface. They're kind of similar movies. Both are about criminals. This one is a little bit different. Yes. Um, it's not what I'd call a gangster movie. 100% not. Also, not like the Scarface that we did on a uh, Spectator, but the one that you, people think of when you say spec near Scarface. Huh? The 1983 one? Yeah. Um, a lot of fans of... <laughs> Both movies, this one and that movie, annoy the shit out of oh, me. Oh, I mean, they're both film bro yeah. movies. Um, but the 1932 one, I think, actually has more similarities to this movie, where both gangsters sort of inspired a type of celebrity fan base culture, where a lot of people, I think more explicitly, and, and we sort of take that for granted a little bit more about those gangster movies as part of the genre, because you know you had like... Bonnie and Clyde, who were famous in the papers, right? And it was a big thing in America. There was kind of like a celebrity around these violent criminals at the time. And then they were making movies about them in real time, right? So it was like Scarface comes out and it's like kind of based on Al Capone. And that was only several years ago, you know? Um, and of, of course, that movie's a huge hit. The weird thing about that movie, though, that connects to this is that that movie also had a huge thing about the censorship. There was a famous pre-code movie, and that's why you have some of those weird scenes in that movie where it pauses in the middle, and they, like, address the camera to say, like, Crime this is on doesn't you. pay. It's bad, folks. <laughs> this is, like, and yet again, not to be the nitpicky asshole. Alex, come on there, buddy. What are you thinking? <laughs> What do you have to gain? We know that Alex recognizes him. Yes, he had the internal monologue. So it is this weird question of why is he doing that? But th this is what I'm talking about. We're we're going to get some thing that's like it it's a mixture between like a visceral bodily reaction like a panic attack but also like you could argue a weird type of similarity or comparison can be made to the conditioning. My point is that it's very much like a bodily affective response that Patrick McGee can seem to not control with his crazy eyes. Seems like a panic attack to me. Severe, but 
I mean, I wouldn't make any sort of assumption about what this movie is saying it is, though. Because I'm like, this movie's not interested in the specificities of whether yeah. it's a panic attack. It just wants you to know that he's fucking flipping out and that he cannot control his body. And in my mind, that associates it a little bit with the conditioning that Alex feels. Of course, with slightly different results. I mean, Patrick McGee is going to sort of fly off into a murderous rage. Try the wine. Yes, the line everyone loves to say from this <laughs> because of his weird hammy delivery. Patrick McGee is another actor who's like weird, but I think I like him. <laughs> he's in a lot of neat movies and he's just a character actor, but he always he's always interesting to watch. You know who Darth Vader now looks like? Jeff Goldblum. That too. He looks like he could play uh, Clark Kent. <laughs> he did made like a Superman movie. <laughs> I'm just a nerdy reporter. Look at me. That's just the dumbest shit. Whoever who thought of that? I'm just going to put glasses on him. I know everyone says it, but really, like, what the fuck? There's a vine. It was just like, so why does Clark look like Superman? Oh, he is Superman. It's just like, oh, you aren't we going to confront him about it? It's like, <laughs> you can if you want. I like the idea that everybody's just humoring him. The question is, why does he not just beat the shit out of him? Does he already know that he's going to suffer from the Ludovico technique training? We know that uh, this character is sort of like a, he's kind of like a uh, leftist Marxist writer, even though he's revealed to be a hypocrite because he wants to kill Alex, which I don't think is like, you raped his wife and then she died. Like, yeah. And also in the book, he's the one writing a novel called A Clockwork Orange. So it's this weird meta thing, perhaps? Yeah. Which is even weirder, though, Max, because the reason why Anthony Burgess... It's not the reason he wrote A Clockwork Orange, but he wrote it in the same year with, like, five other books because he was... he. I think he got diagnosed with, like, a brain tumor, and he was horrified he was going to die and leave his family with nothing. So he just started churning out books, and he would do that, actually, for the rest of his career. I think he wrote, like... 55 books between the time A Clockwork Orange was published and his death, which is insane. That's, oh my God, that's so much writing. I guess if you just get used to that, then... I Some writers can just churn yeah. shit out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a really weird thing though, is like that bizarre connection. But also it's like, am I supposed to take that hit, like Patrick McGee's political beliefs are now like invalid because he wants revenge against this guy who fucking rapes his wife in front of him i don't think so i think it's i think it's supposed to be that like regardless of how good you are like or what your political beliefs are if you choose i don't know because i think the thing is that it wants us to feel like oh he's recovered he's innocent now it's like it doesn't yeah. erase what you did I guess, yeah, it is supposed to be like they're both using Alex, like both parties are using Alex for the political ends of just like, look, yeah. we cured him of evil. And it's like, look, we tortured him to show that you're actually making him suffer. It's like, sorry, he yeah. raped his wife. Like, that's what I'm saying where this movie doesn't fairly compare one moral argument with the other one. It wants you to treat them as the same, but it's like, I'm sorry, they're not the same. You can't just pretend what happened didn't happen. And you know what? Maybe that's another part of this movie that's a little bit dated. Because yeah. I think one of the things we talked about in the preview screening was like, this movie seems to be arguing that morality and our ideas of virtue versus evil are sort of discursive and constructed and therefore specific to the society at the time when we're living. You know, they're not necessarily concrete. They're not tangible things. Um, and that they're going to be like hypocritical in some way if you try to assert it to control other people and remove from them their ability to live life their own way, right? It's the assertion of the mor morality that becomes like fascistic is I think the point of this movie, even though I think it's sloppy and I don't find that super profound. Um, but also, can I just say real quick? Okay. You, you assess that like the guy in the wheelchair, he's part of a leftist party. Yeah. I don't 
inherently believe either party, like either person represents the government in power, doesn't represent necessarily any government. And these ones don't represent any government. I think they're just supposed to be opposing parties to each other. And they're both trying to play off of Alex to get them. Cause all they ever talk about is like the polls show the polls show. Yeah. And they don't ever say specific stances on things. Well, that's okay. That's sort of, I totally agree with that. Yeah. They call themselves one thing, but I don't think the movie actually shows them like adhering to anything specific about that thing. It's just like, Oh, they're in opposition. Yeah. It sort of is trying to abstract them, which is like, it's all, it's not a both sides ask argument, but it's in the same ballpark. Yes. It's like the whole, it's the stupidity of like liberal centrists who are like, who only measure like the validity of an argument based on how close it is to like the center and how reasonable it sounds to them. And then it's like, what are you talking about? Like they're the two poles this, on the spectrum are not close to one another. And it makes no sense to be in the middle between them. But when you try to abstract like the arguments of something politically, that's what you're going to wind up doing. And that always makes it like feel more stupid and conservative ultimately, because when this movie sort of throws its hands up in the air, that feels more like a conservative yeah. concession to me. That feels like a surrender because it's like, well, who cares? Right. It's like, actually it is. We can, we can do this guys. We can live in a world that's better. Maybe. We don't have to just be like, you're a hypocrite. How dare you? Don't tell me how to live. <laughs> the fucking, he's still a pretentious hipster, even all of that. <laughs> yes. He still identifies with Beethoven. Just like, oh, you, you wouldn't know how to spell Beethoven. Let me, <laughs> let me help you with that. <laughs> I do love <laughs> what the framing of this is great with just him being like as curmudgeonly as possible. Yeah. In the corner. And we're drawn to him being curmudgeonly and then the wine are framed by these two people. And just the spaghetti. Yeah. It's like, what's happening? It's just, that's the thing I really love about Stanley Kubrick. The older I get, it seems is like he somehow makes so many different things amusing in this very like roundabout and often very seem maybe close to cruel, but a sardonic and like detached way. But sometimes it's just like so fucking funny. Yeah. And well, he's just like sitting there. The curmudgeon <laughs> is framed by the bottle and the glass as well. It's so well done. Oh God. <laughs> well, this asshole just talks about like Beethoven or whatever. <laughs> now, Max, question is this the first face in the spaghetti moment in film history It'd be an important milestone maybe i feel like it can't be <laughs> not even bill nye shakes and quivers his lips quite as much as patrick mcgee but just you wait bill nye will hear this and not bill nye bill nye i should specify <laughs> bill nye will hear it and just be like ah oh. <laughs> It'll be like that guy from Star Wars. What's that guy's name? <laughs> what guy? This frog guy. <laughs> oh, that one. He's like, Brrr. do you remember this? <laughs> Excuse me. All right, whatever. Are you talking about Jab of the Hut, or are you talking about? No, not him. Are you He's talking about the slug? Are you talking about the racist uh, guy from the Phantom Menace? It's like eh, no pod is worth it. No, <laughs> not the used car salesman. Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's got a trunk. Does he look like a frog to you? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. You know what? We can leave that in the past. We don't have to worry about it. And of course, now we've come full circle where... Uh, He's destroying this dollhouse. It does look like a dollhouse. It's kind of fucking weird. But uh, Patrick McGee is now sadistically torturing Alex in the same way that he was torturing him, much in the same way that uh, Alex would go into a hysterical Dionysian frenzy of violence when he would feel the inspiration from the ninth symphony. Uh, now Patrick McGee is doing the same thing. Of course, there is also the interesting thing of uh, Patrick McGee's character's name, which is what F Alexander. 
Uh, uh, it's almost like some sort of dualism or something going on, right? So we've now reached Alex's double, perhaps, uh, and and learned that the double is is similar to him, yet completely different, and yet they are both revealed to be sadistic and interested in violence. <laughs> What the fuck is that guy doing there? He's the most bored of this. Just gonna throw some red balls on the. <laughs> I'm just more impressed that they had this sound system ready to go. Those are like giant, giant fucking amps stacked on each other. He said, "Get the car." So I'm assuming they brought them both. Them. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Maybe Darth Vader had them. He looks a little bit younger. Maybe he parties on the weekends. It's no time to see if this sound system is fully operational. Oh, <laughs> my God. Uh. Do you feel sympathy for Alex? Well, I think it's just because, like, the movie and the book do a good job of the fact that, like, it's been a long time since we've seen Alex do bad things in the movie. Right. So to a degree, yes. But like then upon rewatching it, you're like, no, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. I just wish there was more of an ironic diff like distance from him. I think the movie is maybe a little bit too within his mind in different scenes. Yet at the same time, it's inconsistent because even at the very beginning to harken back to, that moment we discussed with the girl and the camera following her as she leaves, that seems to be an indication of the camera uh, paying attention to details that Alex is not interested in, especially if you're rolling with like the homoerotic reading of this where he's more interested in fighting these dudes than the woman. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's sort of something that doesn't reappear quite as much throughout the rest of the movie. And even here, it seems like he is now back in charge of the mizzen scene because his narration really starts to guide this sort of epilogue once again, where he's going to start describing all the things that are happening to, happening to him. And as he does so, that's when we're going to get the information about where he is, his state of mind and his body. It's going to be revealed to us. Did we really? That's yeah. just like a dumb joke. Uh, oh, God, the nurse and doctor are fucking look out. Oh no. <laughs> I'm just thinking of like modern British newspapers. Just being like Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> it's his fault somehow. He did everything wrong. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn brainwashed a young youth. Revelation. Jeremy Corbyn was the young youth. <laughs> brainwashed by Jeremy Corbyn. Turns out the young youth is innocent. It was Jeremy Corbyn who killed the cat lady. Yeah. What's the American equivalent? Are we going to blame some Bernie bros or something? Yeah. How dare they? Russian bots and Bernie bros <laughs> killed a cat. Women. <laughs> they were so angry. Oh, God. They they caused so much disruption on Twitter that this woman died. Ruined our lives. They sent her so many mean spirited messages and memes that she just fucking exploded. That's something I'm very sick of. It's like anytime somebody brings up something against Joe Biden, they're just like, okay, Bernie, bro. I'm just like, you can't just like. That just doesn't mean anything. Don't you, you understand that doesn't work as an argument? You can't just like write off any criticism of your candidate as like either interference by another country or somebody like just trolling by somebody on the internet by a phantom enemy you've created. Like it's insanity. <laughs> At the very least, the Trumpian fake news in that term offers an explanation why for why they should discredit you. Whereas when you just get called a Bernie bro, it's just like, that just explains nothing. That's just like, you're just deciding not to like, listen. <laughs> oh man, it's so aggravating. <laughs> you can tell how appealing British food is because the meat and that thing had, a, had to have a thing that says, eat me on it. The eggy in the blanket. Yeah, that's my big question from uh, this recording today is what the fuck is Rare Bit? Let us know down in the comments below. Make sure to like and subscribe. For real, if you could leave a review of our show that's five stars, 
but then also explains what rarebit is. I'll read that on the show aloud. <laughs> I promise you. Whatever you write, Austin will read it. As long as it explains what rarebit is, he'll read every word of what you write. That is a promise from the Spectator Film Podcast to you. And I'm wondering, like, because the purple hair thing, it could just be, like, a quirky aesthetic choice, but, like, is that supposed to be that, like, all these women just follow along with society and that's, what, like, what's in style right now, so all these women are dressed ridiculously? And it's- I mean, that's an interesting question to ask. You can ask a lot of questions about the way this movie treats women, and it extends to the decor. Um, you don't just want to talk about the way the camera is behaving because uh, women are very ornamental in this movie. There's not a lot for them to do. They're mostly just objects when they're here. It seems like they're only here as like prisms through which men like look at one another and then like attack one another. So it's like they really don't play a huge role. And when you see like aesthetic differences in them, it seems to maybe even more so than like a main character seems to be more conspicuous because they they seem to be closer to just a pure ornament anyway. Yeah. especially because there's not a male corollary. You look at the old crusty old men in this and they yeah. just look like recognizable crusty old men. There's no aesthetic through line through them though. Like, well, it's just the same. The author like wears robes and is writing and then like the old man, or his dad is like a standard businessman that we'd see like back then and today. Yeah. No, They're, the, the old men just look as you expect them to look. Oh, we missed the opportunity to make with a bird with the crystal plumage joke. Oh, damn it. About that bird with the pretty plumage. Oh, is this the closest that this movie comes towards a uh, title drop? <laughs> They're talking about the clocks. Yeah. He says, shove it up your ass. What the fuck are those eggs? Eggy wig. <laughs> so Max, why do you think Alex is so alluring aside from the performance? What do you think gives this character such like lasting? Yeah, okay. So the reason I was going to initially focus on before I started to do more research about this movie and kind of be more honest with myself about mm-hmm. my history with it was this the character of Alex falls into an increasingly wide spectrum of characters that the internet basically hasn't found a good term for yet, but it's like characters that you're missing the point of the entire thing by identifying them, identifying with them. Yeah. Um, Tyler Durnan and fight club is another good example. Yes. He's a really good example. Rick, uh, Rick from Rick and Morty, like the Joker in the Joker. Stuff like that. Characters that have like are damaged and shitty, shitty people. And the whole point is like how you shouldn't be like them. But like, but also to add on to that, at least as far as fight club is concerned, because I haven't seen Joker is like, you're talking about movies that you could potentially argue, get too on board with those characters as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, and some of them don't, but but either way, there's yeah. less there's there is the identification going on with them, you know, with the audience. And yeah. we're not making like stupid arguments about like the weird like satanic panic arguments that a lot of people, even at the time, reviewers were making about how like, you know, different like seemingly like pop psychology arguments about like, oh, repeated exposure to violence or whatever is gonna make our teens violent or something. No, it's not that. It's, it's more about speaking to something that's already there, it seems. It's more of just like, for me, Alex represented when I was younger, like a disregard for authority, like I was a teenager. So there was just like a huge amount of sexual explosion and energy there. Yeah. Um, And an indulgence in weird hobbies in a delightfully irreverent, irreverent way 
And also gender queering to a degree. Yeah. Um, as contradictorily as, as that is, it, it is definitely the case, despite the fact that he's such a violent masculine dude at different times. He's also, I mean, look at the way they dress and they prowl yeah. around with one another. And so to me that like, because I, I never identified with like big masculine, like I'm going to do whatever I want and fuck these ladies and yeah, drink beer all the time. And like that stuff always put me off when I was a teenager and like, I don't know. It, it, it was like a different kind of like strange out there character. And I think in my eagerness to embrace that, I was very okay with just sort of poo pooing some stuff on any stuff on the side. Right. I focused on the stuff I liked and sort of just threw away the stuff I didn't. And actually now that we're talking about this, I think that specifically is why he's successful because this is obviously a very well-made movie. There's lots of really fascinating visual things about it. And honestly, I just love so many of the individual design decisions. They're like iconic for a reason, but also like, I think if this movie did more intelligently or more clearly come down with some sort of opinion about Alex and his behavior, then maybe it wouldn't have the same appeal because maybe the movie has to somehow not have enough distance from its character in order for so many like younger adolescent audience members to identify with them in that way. Because Alex, as we've been talking about, he's full of contradictions, but the one thing that he truly hammers home is he's like irreverent and anti-authority. And he has an interest in something that makes him seem smarter than the people around him. He's a little bit more clever, a little bit more devious. He likes to have fun doing these things. But the fact that he's so he's filled with so many contradictions gives him a broad appeal to anybody who's feeling somehow rebellious or, yeah. or like they're, they're like not the same as the people around them, which is teenagers, yes. but that's going to be teenagers across a really broad spectrum too, because the movie does not come down with a really solid definitive opinion about what he's doing. And it is perhaps too close to his own subjective interpretation of what's going on, which makes sense. Cause like y you have, <laughs> weirdo queers like me who identified with this movie. And you also have like the same people who identify like who missed the, I mean, fight clubs. I keep bringing it up. It's a bad example. I think it's a good example. Well, cause the book, like the book makes it abundantly clear in fight club of just like, no, this is about toxic, toxic masculinity and how it's like destroying these people don't read. Yeah. Destroying our society. But anyway, um, they buy a Jordan Peterson book yeah, and they put the, it on their bookshelf. It's how those people, like the people who worship Alex as like a masculine figure yeah. can also like get that same enjoyment out of this movie. Yeah. And it's because it has those contradictions without settling them in a way that maybe is not satisfying for us in retrospect. Yes. But the interesting thing about that too and why the Fight Club comparison works is because, again, what do we have in that movie like this movie? Lots of violent masculinity, but also homosocial, homoerotic masculinity. But then also the other key to this puzzle seems to be David Fincher is, again, a very technically proficient, masterful director, right? So it's two directors who are very good at finding talented people to work with, good at getting the right performances for the role, and they make it look beautiful and interesting, and they make a movie that has a cultural impact because of these specific characters. Uh, but also maybe because they don't, I don't know, make the movie in a way that we would find quite as satisfying now, which is interesting. Certainly wouldn't make me make the face that Alex making right now. Where he's fully reverting back to his violence. He's literally having an orgasm right now. Yeah. It's kind of while the Victorians watch. Yes. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> That's how the Brits have sex. Only one of them was allowed to <laughs> each winter. All of them clap. And they have to, yeah, they have to get there and applaud them. Yeah. This is like his version of what's inside the snow globe for citizen Kane <laughs> is him just having sex while people in Victorian dress clap. Oh God. But yes, that's been a clockwork orange max on a, on the spectator film podcast. Yeah. So, uh, any last thoughts on the movie? I thought, I know it's a challenging movie to talk about because it is so culturally important. I feel like we really barely got into, uh, you know, the really amazing, like 
history it has outside of the movie itself. Like, I think the distribution is really interesting. I'm going to be linking to some sources in the show notes that are going to be uh, a lot of fun to read up on for anybody who's interested in that. Um, but definitely this is a movie that like, I feel like you can continue to return to because the, the design and, and just the way they hit home, these characters are so great. And I mean, it's just a really genuinely amazing performance on Malcolm McDowell's part. So there's a lot of reasons to return to this movie, I think, uh, despite the fact that I don't think it's really that great overall. <laughs> I, I, I think it is good. Um, <sighs> Carol drink water. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Sure. But sorry, that was a credit just to specify. <laughs> I just said, I didn't just say that randomly. Austin that was a just credit. likes interrupting me. It's, yeah. Um, Carol drink water. <laughs> but I don't know. It, <sighs> conflicting feelings. Conflicting feelings. Yeah. Because yesterday was more of a shock to my system for me of just like, oh, who? Because um, I remember a lot of the graphicness being done in more artistic ways. Yeah. And some of the, the fact that some of it is just not as Kubricky as I remember to put it for lack of a better term. Sure. Less stylistic, less shiny, less masterful camera work kind of dampened the glamor on it for me a little bit. On the other hand, now that like I've had time to sort of mull over my feelings on it a bit, and feel less guilt of being associated with the, a lot of people I don't like who really like this movie. Right. Um, I agree. It's not one of, it's not Kubrick's best film at all, but I still think it's a great movie. Um, even though it's not one of my favorites. Yeah. It's definitely a great movie in the sense of like what it has to offer. If yes. not being great on its own. Also, one more thing I wanted to mention that I completely neglected is that another fun fact about this movie is that I believe it's maybe the first movie ever to be shot entirely with onset audio. Huh. And that was a really important thing to bring up because think about how much of a difference that makes with the contrast of his narration compared to all the dialogue scenes being shot with like lavalier mics or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, that's just yet another interesting technical innovation. We're also they... the first podcast to use entirely onset audio. No, <laughs> that's just not true. Uh, but if you want to hear to more episodes of our podcast, that was not the first to use uh, onset audio, whatever the fuck that means even, uh, you can find more episodes at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on uh, iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. And uh, we also have a letterbox account where we keep track of all our movies. And I even post lists of which ones we've chosen. <laughs> so you can see that Max was the one that chose Repo the Genetic Opera, not me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's all I have to say. What about you, Max? Get along, real friends, real horror show now. <laughs> <laughs>